Um, just for the uh, until we call you in. But we are we're yeah we're live now, so you're good. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Konbanwa, <laughs> hajimashite. How is everyone doing? We are here for uh, another episode of Tokyo House Party. And Momo is having, she's close to meltdown, but I do promise her at the beginning. And so here she is, um, not at the dog park today or at the moment, but it's it's nice to be back, she feels, sort of. Just uh, too warm. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like before we get started, Derek, would you be up for updating everyone all of the cool things coming up? Next, oh, time, uh, there's so much happening. We have a lot of updates. Uh, there's, there's a lot of cool things. Um, they, our next episode, is well okay because time is a, a wibbly wobbly thing and and completely non-existent by uh our, our current circumstances so i have to remember that our next show is on august 22nd so be sure to come back for that because that is a very very special episode uh we will be talking with thomas lockley and jeffrey gerard the co-authors to the uh, bibliography african samurai uh this concerns the uh a, a very real person in history uh, by the name of Yasuke and the relationship to uh, the relationship with Oda Nobunaga, as well as the Portuguese who arrived in the 16th century of Japan. So if you are a fan of samurai, if you are a fan of Afro samurai, if you are a fan of uh, hip hop music that has used samurai movie samples, I think this is a really opportune time to step in and, and explore this episode with us because there's a lot of cool uh, information that we'll be sharing with you. Um, not to mention, we'll also have uh, a guest with us who um, uh, practices Iaido, uh, and they will be uh, sharing with you some very, very cool elements of that as well. Yeah, it's going to be a really cool one. So we always like to hype the next one because each, all of the episodes lately have just been so stellar. We want to give you some heads up. So it's been, it's been awesome. And yeah. This episode is no different. Um, I, I imagine that a lot of you out there have already seen the topic for today's show and you're a little aware of what we'll be exploring today. But um, just the preference before we even begin the conversation, this episode will be talking a lot about the intersection between art and activism. And it's important to note, um, I think for everybody, just as like a way to enter these kinds of conversations, we're here on the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, so, of course, this topic is a little, perhaps a touch less casual than our usual conversations, but with lots of meaning and intent. So knowing that, um, for all of us here sharing the space together today, uh, I just wanted to kind of throw out there that we're just going to be hearing a lot of different perspectives and different perspectives are wonderful. It's what makes us who we are. And uh, no one can, no one is uh, right or wrong for having them. And we welcome all um, thoughts and ideas but respectfully so. So understanding that um, some of these conversations have a lot of um, oh, emotion and thoughts and feels behind them. So giving everyone that due respect. And also um, you'll be hearing tons of new information today. And I think part of what we look forward to in sharing new information is um, with the understanding that when you hear something new, you can change your mind. You can also be bolstered in your original thoughts, but some new information coming to you is always a welcome place for change. So. I feel like that's also at the crux of this art plus activism kind of conversation. Perfectly so, said. Thank you so much, Derek. Yeah, do you, would you yeah. like to add anything to this culture we're kind of talking about creating amongst us? Uh, you know, as always, I would say, um, you know, in, in being mindful, please uh, don't hesitate to ask questions mm -hmm. and, and create opportunities for yourself to learn new things. And so uh, we are always keeping watchful eye of the chat and are uh, eager to hear from you so that we can uh, posit these questions with our guests uh, live on the show. So, yeah. And with that said, I... I won't say I won't gush too much because it makes everyone terribly uncomfortable. But this night is full of all of my earnest favorite people. So I'm so jazzed for everyone that's going to be coming on. And we have an action packed night, perhaps not like any other, and that we have a lot of different guests and a lot of things rolling through. So um, to start us off, though, uh, we have a very, very, very special artist who I've had the pleasure of working with. Um, oh, my goodness, years ago now. It's hard to believe so much time has passed. But uh, his name is Michael Corner, and he exhibits here in Chicago. Um, he uh, does, uh, you know what? I actually am going to let him use the terminology that I am about to butcher. And let's just bring in Michael so we can introduce himself and we can kind of get to know what he's about. 
Yes. Hey, Michael. Hey, hey. thanks for having me on. Oh, don't forget you're muted. Oh, okay. I think I just turned it. Oh, no. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah. Oh, really? Really? Uh -oh. Oh. <laughs> I'm I'm here this time. Okay. I will, uh, <laughs> I will break away and I will return. Let me refresh and make sure that uh, audio is. Well, while Derek reboots so he can join our conversation, um, I'll also note that oh. um, Michael has been um, working on a new show that just opened. And he's also been creating these similar artworks for some time now that explore this topic of um, the nuclear past and present. And uh, I'm sure he will tell you more about um, his perspective and what he's doing and how he does it, because we're so fortunate to learn a little bit about his process too. Um, but he's a really amazing individual and has a very um, compelling life at the moment. So without further ado, maybe Michael, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? And Derek, can you hear him? Uh, can you give me a test, Michael? Yeah, sure. So hopefully you can hear me. You got Derek yes. back. Derek can hear me. Awesome. Perfect. <laughs> well, thank, thanks for having me on. And that was just a wonderful introduction. So, so that was like a little bit too much gushing for me. It's a little uncomfortable. Are you, as you that, was, that was very mild. So it was mild. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I can tell you a little bit about my background, uh, especially for the, um, the, uh, the occasion that's happening uh, tomorrow for the for the memorial and also last uh, last Thursday. Uh, I'm a uh, the, the sole oldest surviving son of a Habakusha who is a uh, my mother who was a survivor of the Naga Nagasaki atomic bomb blast. And uh, from that background, from that history, uh, I use that um, as my driving force to pr produce a lot of my art. Uh, it is uh, um, based on historic photographic processes from the 1850s and 1860s, actually called ten types. So I have a background in chemistry. I actually I'm a lecturer, a senior lecturer of organic chemistry at the University of Illinois in Champaign Urbana. So I have a lot of different angles going on here. I'm using a lot of chemistry. I'm looking at a lot of literature from the 1860s and on. I'm reproducing a lot of uh, uh, ten type technologies all in hopes of saying my message, which is based on being a, uh, it's actually called Habakusha Nisei. I'm a second generation survivor. So my mother was a survivor of the atomic bomb blast in Nagasaki. So I'm trying to get that message out there using my art. Yeah. And, you know, being um, represented by the Catherine Adelman Gallery here in Chicago. So that's super awesome. And they, they've been so yeah. good to me. They've been just so awesome. So um, the show is going on now. The exhibit's going now. Go visit. They, they have extended hours and, they're practicing safe distancing and, and uh, wear a mask. Yeah, yeah, they're amazing and they just moved. And I feel like what's really wonderful is you are such a compelling person to speak to about this kind of intersection of art and activism and how art can actually um, um, be a, its own catalyst for activism in ways that maybe some others out there haven't considered activism to be. And because you're speaking to something that's very important and it's a topic that is still very relevant. And I think that that's um, on the 75th anniversary uh, something that we can definitely highlight, especially in, in what you're up to now. Yeah, it's um, it's it's kind of a it's kind of like an oxymoron, a, a peace activist. It's kind of like you, you have the you know, the message is to be peaceful, but activism has some connotations of being very aggressive and getting a message out there. So it's a very nice combination to have. I think it's a it's a it's a good uh, a message of strength. I'd say. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely, and. Catherine Edelman Gallery just moved, and I don't know um, how many viewers we have from Chicago right now, but that is located here in Chicago, and it's just moved to the West Town area of Chicago. Um, What's the name maybe, of that gallery? With, uh, Catherine Edelman. Yeah, they're on the corner of Chicago and Ashland. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get a link up for everybody. So, Michael, I wonder if you could tell us a little about how you came um, to produce these really unique and beautiful and sobering kind of artworks um, through your combination of chemistry and artistic value and um, own experiences. Yeah, it was a battle. <laughs> Just <laughs> straight, straight up, it was it was hard work. Um, yeah, I, I, I would say it was harder to produce what I wanted in my art than it was for me to get my PhD. Oh, wow. It took me, it took me four years of like hard work and a lot of gnashing of teeth to get my PhD, but it took me like six years to figure out um, 
how to how to create these fractal patterns, these silver mm-hmm. growth and dendritic fern like patterns. And what was the most aggravating um, was that I knew they existed because I saw in the literature, and I actually have some. I actually collect ten types, and I have I have some around here. I'm not sure if it's gonna didn't plan on doing this, but oh yeah, here, sure. here, here's a tin type from from the 1860s. Wow. See way in the corner, see that, or even this down here. It's kind of hard to see, but there's see that, that pattern. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I'm getting. Uh, and there's, I looked and I tried for years to figure out this, how this works and what the most aggravating thing in life is to know that it does exist, but you can't do it. It's just really frustrating. <laughs> so it's been years and years. I gave up a handful of times and, uh, and giving up is just in my personality, even harder for me to do. Hmm. Uh, it's, I have, exi- I have, I have examples of 10 types from the 1800s, which have these fractal patterns which are considered like fatal flaws or mistakes. They're rare because they didn't give them to the photographers, didn't give them to the customers. Mm -hmm. It was just so embarrassing of a mistake. So how I got through this obstacle was I went through the literature from the 1800s. I'm really, I'm I'm very privileged to have access to library references and online search capabilities to to look at any research I want and any subject I want. I was able to get the, the, the uh, uh, literature from old photographers from the mid 1800s, and they'd say, "This is what you don't want to do." And I was like, oh, "No, I want to do that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that 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 thing right there. That's what I want to do. So uh, I was able to create that. It took like six years. I started in 2009. And it took like two, it took 2015 is when I actually got this um, to actually go the want way they wanted to go. And since then, I basically followed that procedure of looking through the literature. I think I've read it all um, and basically came upon a certain like technique as we went along. I wonder if we could see one of them, Derek, so that everyone can see what he means by those kind of fractal. We sure can. Let's see here. I'm going to work on my light over here. And I will get our additional microphones, make sure that I have those accounted for so everybody can hear while we look at these stunning images. Two, I wonder, um, Michael, if you could tell us about what you're thinking of in making these, what, what, what's your perspective on, on creating these kinds of um, shapes and forms? What is that informed by, I suppose? Um, a lot of it's music. Mm-hmm. I have to get in the right mood. Uh, I have to get into the right, um, I guess, level of angst. Um, and it, as I do this in a dark room. I work 365 days a year. Uh, it's a couple hours at least every single day. Mm-hmm. Lots of times at like two in the morning. Um, and uh, it's going to be, it's going to sound weird, but I hear voices. The most recently, I my brother who died a while ago. <clears throat> I could I could hear his voice saying it's you know, it's time to come home, and uh, it just freaked me out. My my the hairs on my arms are are like, and I'm thinking no I can't I can't go home. I got things to do. I got, and uh, it, I took that as a metaphor. Um, I took that as like a um, a way to, a way to basically I'm talking to my dead brother, um, mm-hmm. talking to me at least, and I'm talking back to him. And it's two in the morning, and I'm in the dark room, and then my cat walks by and rubs against my leg and freaks me out. So it's like that, that that's perfect. Like go with that work until mm-hmm. four in the morning and, and see what I can see, what comes out of this. Mm-hmm. So a lot of this is just basically in the mood, uh, the music, the, the thought that's going through my mind at the time. And some, some strange stuff comes out, some strange stuff kind of pr- gets produced. And then it's a battle. Like, can I get that again? And can I make a series out of this? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's a, it's a nebulous process, mm-hmm. but, um, I don't think I've ever produced anything that didn't have some intensity, some emotional intensity like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're, you're right. Too weird. And everyone, everyone's level of respect for me just went down when I talk about dead brothers <laughs> talking. <to me. laughs> no, no. You know, I, 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 I hope I can speak for Sarah as well when I say we we both kind of come from a, a certain edgy appreciation for all mediums, and so uh, when it comes to uh, you know, expression in our own right, um, it involves a lot of uh, black and, <laughs> and other things that might go along with that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to ask, you mentioned having to go back and explore 
some of the documentation of tintype uh, within the 1800s. And, you know, the, only on, a, on an assumption, I would imagine when somebody says, don't do this, they probably don't expand in much detail as to why you shouldn't do it, uh, because they're, they're probably, you know, uh, trying to avoid it. How uh, have you, in exploring how to create intentionality in, in doing this, how have you carved that path and, and found uh, purpose in what was formerly assumed as uh, mistakes or, or flaws? Yeah, it's it's personal preference. It's like a, what one person's flaws, one person's mistakes mm -hmm. are. Um, it's kind of like when you're when you're a little kid and your mom cuts the crust off the bread when yeah. your sandwich is made and sends you puts in a little bag. I'm not sure that's what my mom did. Yeah. Uh, and then you you, you I, I open this up my little lunch box. I had my little Japanese lunch box. Opened it up, and I see my sandwich. All the crust is is cut off. I'm like. Why? That's the good part. Yeah. <laughs> why are you right. cutting out? Why, why are you like throwing away the good part? That's mm -hmm. where the, the the texture is. Where it's where the flavor is. You know, it has. You know, I was hoping to have all the all the carrot, all the seeds and stuff on there. I got I got white bread, mm -hmm. and the person next to me is like, oh, I love white bread. Like, want to trade? So <laughs> yeah, it's like you said, the people in the eighteen fifties, like, don't you know this? This is horrible. Don't ever do this. Don't show your customers that there's there's growth of fractals and silver. And this mm -hmm. pattern, that's, that's awful. It's like, no, I want that. I want the crust. I, I, show, show me show me more of that. It's kind of like, it's almost, you know, I I've been collecting tin types and hard images, like daguerreotypes, amber types and such for a decade now. It's now it's like, when you collect anything, when you actually get really involved in anything, no matter what it is, if, if it's comic books or, you know, baseball cards, you look for the esoteric, you look for the weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't care what Certainly. you're you're into. If you're into, I don't, I just make it up. Whatever you're like knitting, you, you <laughs> just want to see. What? Well, whoa! Look at that pattern. Like I've never yeah. seen that before. I want that. Yeah. So, to you answer know. your question, I went wild on like the ordinary, and nothing wrong with that. Tin typists take portraits, perfectly yeah. clean, awesome portraits. Some of my friends are great tin type artists. Uh, I used to do that too, but now I want the weird stuff. Yeah. Well, I wonder if you could also, you'd mentioned um, when we first started this word hibaksha and that word, and I, and I was introduced to another um, term that's really important to your artwork called gaman the last time we spoke. And I wonder if you might, um, in your perspective, um, give everyone an idea about what those two words are and mean and why that's important to what you're creating. Yeah. Yeah, in my mind, we're going through stories upon. I, mean, like, I guess we have time, so I'm going to go back. We do. We do. Stories. So, uh, I took a, a photographic workshop from a great uh, um, photographer. His name is Keith Carter, um, a mentor of mine. Uh, if you're a photographer, you, you know the name. But um, he he says something in this workshop. It's, a, it's like a six day long workshop. We're living on campus uh, in Santa Fe, and with a group of us, a small group of like ten of us. And he said something the very first day that I wrote down and I kept, and I have it in my dark room. And it says, if you want to be an artist, tell the story that you are afraid to tell. Mm. No matter what you do, if you want to be an artist, you have to have a message. A big part of art is having a message. Yeah. Don't say the stuff that you want people to think about you. Say the stuff that you're afraid that people will think about you. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, that was the start for me. That was like, okay, Wow, that was, and even then, I had to wait till my parents had been had had been dead. My dad, my father died in two thousand three. My mother died in two thousand eight. So this is a year. The workshop is a year after my mom died, and I set on this little journey and say, okay, this is what the whole family is afraid to talk about. This is what we didn't really talk about. Um, you know, I've talked to family members in the past uh, that said, you know, their you know their families, their Japanese counterparts of their families didn't say anything. They didn't say crap. Mm -hmm. They didn't talk about anything. And my mom had sisters before they died, would not tell their daughters anything. Um, they were just amazed, like, how do you know this? It's like, well, I just was doggedly persistent and say, you tell me, you tell me, you tell me. And um, my, my cousins back then said, yeah, we tried that too, we got hit. <laughs> so I, I basically had to force it, force the story out. So now I'm telling a story that's really, really objectionable to many people. It's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, people hearing me talk about this, uh, I've had people talk to me like, how do you say this? And then I know that they're of Asian descent. Like, 
I know where you're getting at. Like, yeah, it's, it helps when my parents and all my family are gone now. They're all passed away. It helps because they're not here to tell me that I'm stupid, um, that I'm like hurting the family name in some way. Um, because that concept of gaman, it's basically saying you suffer in silence and I'm not suffering in silence. It's sorry. It's, uh, I'm doing the opposite. You know, I'm elevating the story. It's a, it's a sad story in many aspects in different directions. It's a sad story. And, and I'm, uh, I'm moving it up the, uh, the, uh, the, the ladder of, of, um, you know, attention, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not, gaman, not suffering in silence. Yeah, I think that's so important for, for this conversation too. And um, a lot of what we're talking about today is all these different kinds of perspectives and ways to um, understand the atomic bombings and those who survived it, which would be a hibaksha. That word hibaksha just means someone um, who has actually survived uh, one of the atomic bombings, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to um, endure, at least you know for some amount of time. Um, and uh, this word gaman is actually something I, I didn't know too much about until Michael introduced it to me some years ago. Um, and so I will do my utmost to help kind of give it some context because probably most of our viewers are totally unfamiliar. Um, but it's uh, something like um, it's your responsibility to bear things um, um, such as this kind of a burden. Um, and I think what you're you're speaking of now, maybe you could expand upon that and how you felt that this was a way to release some of that gaman. Yeah, it's actually a sense of honor. It's actually a virtue. If you're mm -hmm. suffering in silence and uh, and people know that you're suffering in silence and you're not saying anything about it, it's a sense of it's a it's a an honorable thing to do that. Mm -hmm. Not draw attention to yourself. Mm -hmm. So um, even you know, I'll, I'll weave it into the story of that's uh, relevant during the atomic bomb blast. People who were surviving were buried under rubble, a giant rubble of buildings and, and just um, heaps of, of debris. And they would call out to passers-by on the road saying, Sumimasen, you know, oh, please excuse me. I don't want to be a burden to you. But if you had time and if you're so inclined, would you please consider giving me some water? It's just too much to ask of someone to come help you. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's that, that sense of uh, that's a virtue also. Mm -hmm. So to ask for help is actually you know, not very virtuous. Same thing with saying, hey, this is a problem. This is a uncomfortable topic this is culturally very difficult to speak about and i'm going to like just yell it out aloud mm. not a virtue <laughs> like mm. no like dude don't don't do don't go there and um i'm going there i'm just going to go there so i'm using myself as an example i'm not trying to embarrass another person or another subset of society i'm using my own personal um ex ex you know stories and my own way of expressing uh you know visually how i want to talk about this topic no disrespect to uh, the, the people or the culture or a country. Uh, it's 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 my it's my story, and I'm I'm taking control of it, and and, and I've gotten some you know pushback for it. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you if you don't mind, what what in your words would be the narrative or the story that you really want to tell through these works? So I have uh, multiple series. Um, one of the one of the things uh, I'm you know. I can boast about is I'm very prolific. I work my butt off, um, and it's tied into it too. It's uh, you know I've, I have some some different aspects of my uh, my health that are they're waning away, and I'm not sure how long I'm going to be here. So every day it's like this could be the last image I make. This could be the last, and it's constantly, like, well, that looks really good. This could be the last one. This could be the last one. This could be so it drives me, it drives me. It's infuriating, but it drives me because I wake up the next day and I say, thank you God for another day. And I go back in the dark room and I start working up the stuff. You know, I, you know, I start creating more solutions. So what are the tenacity? One, one tenacity is to basically be prolific. Mm -hmm. um, that's woven into that story because it's my health and my health has been impinged upon because I'm a survivor of the atomic bomb blast. Uh, uh, I'm a son of a survivor of atomic bomb blast in Nagasaki. Another way is um, my, my mother had actually five sons, five brothers. I'm the oldest of five. So um, after I was born, the next uh, son was um, stillborn or lived a day or so. The next one was um, stillborn. The, the fourth one, I was the first of, the next one was um uh, died in the third trimester, and uh, the fifth brother, my brother Richard, survived, and he went on and got his PhD in chemistry just like I did. 
He's actually a professor at uh, Penn State. I'm at the University of Illinois. He's at Penn State. We're both Big Ten schools. Um, we planned on basically, you know, like being idiots to each other because because of the, the, the schools. But he eventually died at the age of 32 uh, from from cancer. Twice. He had cancer twice. He had non Hodgkin's and lymphoma twice. So I have a whole series called, the, the, you know, the uh, Five Brothers. So all of this... Um, all this angst is is bubbling out in different versions, and um, I forgot who said it, but um, good art comes from trauma, mm. um, and, I, and I'm I'm going to use it. I'm going to use. I'm going to talk about my trauma. I'm going to use it as a driving force to to produce. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I wonder if you feel comfortable telling everyone or letting everyone know who is um, less knowledgeable about what being a hibaksha might mean for your health, and what. Um, that manifests like, like in your family or what, what is, what is the health um, risks about being a Hibaksha and being a second generation Hibaksha and things like this. So that others can kind of um, understand more about the enduring scope of, of that event in your life. Even. It's a complex topic. Uh, countries, uh, experts have uh, tried to try to untangle this topic and uh, it has to do with, um, you know, this, this political, it's economic, and there's different facets to this topic. And for example, the Japanese government wants to limit the number of Hibakusha by saying that if you're not really Hibakusha, unless you're like one kilometer from the central bomb blast, mm -hmm. the Japanese government is going to support you for your medical issues uh, financially if you're Hibakusha. Well, you know, my mother was 30 miles away and she had issues. Yeah. Um, so there's political aspects to this. There's, there's all kinds of different like avenues coming in, political, economic, uh, social, um, and, and like I said, my mom being 30 miles away outside of Nagasaki, uh, not only just being there, cause a lot of people survive, you know, a lot of people died instantly too, but a lot of people survive, had no problems whatsoever. Uh, unfortunately, I, I teach genetics. I teach a genetic component to my, my chemistry class. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my mother being 12 years old at the time is right at the time when you're basically, you know, producing you're right in the middle of your, your, um, reproductive, uh, health. So all of her eggs are, are basically being um, uh, produced during this adolescent period. And, and she's eating the fish that are in the irradiated waters. She's eating the plants that are on the irradiated soil. Uh, the irradiation, the isotopes are in the, in the ground that are being leached into the waterways that she's drinking from the time she, she's 12 years old on. So that has some, some, some you know, some, um, relevance to her offspring being me as opposed to someone who let's say is 30 years old and um uh has her eggs completely developed and there may be issues there too but maybe not as much so we, when they do the studies they do the the uh, nuclear studies on the people who are in the surrounding areas it's different when you're 12 years old and your reproductive health is growing versus let's say a 50 year old man mm. so the studies are convoluted the conclusions are convoluted and of course on top of that, there are survey studies, and no one in Japanese society is going to admit that being, you know, that having health issues. Mm. I am. I'm, I'm on the internet telling you people have health issues. And most people will just say, just lie and say, I have no health issues. And that goes into the survey, and that goes into the study, and the study is misrepresented. Mm. Mm. So lots of facets, lots of research efforts, uh, governments, and there's um, censorship, and there's, there's lots of issues. Mm hmm even today, people with um, uh, some kind of Habakusha background, you know, in their history, in their in their um, in their family history, are are it's strange to think about this, but they're thought they maybe it's contagious, mm -hmm. or maybe it's you know they're they're the looked down upon. Some families will end a prospective marriage because someone one of the two pairings, the family has um, some instance of Habakusha in their ancestry. Yes, that's insane. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. No, and I think I think what's so important about this conversation, your willingness to have it too, is that especially on the 75th anniversary, it feels like it happened so long ago and it feels like that's just a historical event, but that just isn't, according to, I think a lot of the things that we'll be hearing today, that just isn't the case. Mm. And people are still living with this and, and processing it and understanding it and um, responding to it like you are. 
Yeah, it's it's uh, very relevant today. I mean, we you know the the atomic bomb blasts from the nineteen forty the forty fives in in for Nagasaki and Hiroshima were were child's play compared to the, the atomic weaponry that are existing today. I mean, there are hundreds of times uh, more deadly now. A single one is more deadly now, and we have you know thirteen thousand of them in, in in possession around multiple countries. So all it takes is one of you know fifteen or twenty countries to get pissed off at their neighbor and. Here we go again. Yeah. And that's unconscionable. This mm -hmm. is unconscionable. Yeah. yeah. It's something we'll be talking about a lot in the next hour with um yeah, Absolutely, yeah. Let's see if people will will have a very real idea by the time our show is over tonight. Derek, what are you wondering? Uh I I have I've I've so many thoughts uh, there <laughs> um and it's it was hard to choose one, but I'll start by saying uh I wanted to uh um well, first, I want to thank you for being able to speak on that topic because it means so much to me in that I, I this is not a topic that I know about. And this is not um, information that I uh, am, am coming from any knowledge base other than, um, you know, the one time that I got to go to the Hiroshima Museum. And so understanding, um, y you know, it was it was impactful to learn about those events already, but truly recognizing the long term effects of that and and how they exist um in individuals and how that gets interpreted um is is astounding and so um circling back to that that portion of it and how you've interpreted um a being a habaksha uh i wanted to ask how your relationship to your works have possibly changed or grown over time uh, have they taken different forms or, or um, has the process altered for you in a way, be that the ideation, be it the, the technicality um, because of, you know, experiencing loss or interpreting um, these emotions as time goes on. Yeah. It's um, it, it's not like I am practicing a, a method or technique that other people know. I, I kind of invented it myself. So it's, it's very, um, I mean, there aren't other people who are doing this on uh, putting chemicals on 10 types and getting like colors, for example. Right. Um, that, that's bizarre. People looking at me like, this is a black and white process and you're getting blue and like green. Like, yeah. yeah I wanted to ask amazing. about that too. It's amazing. It's, <laughs> it's, um, it, it, it's all based on science. I mean, it's all silver, it's silver metals. It's elemental silver metal particles. You just, you gotta, if you can grow them in the right size and shape, they reflect blue light. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, uh, here, I, I'm working on another project and, uh, you can see that's blue and those, that, those, that dendritic patterns kind of, oh, wow. okay. These um, are amazing. I, I am just blown away. Everything. I, I, amazing. So I, I, I don't have, I don't, I mean, I have really good, I have really good, um, relationships with people that are 10 typists around the, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, also, at like George Eastman House, which is Kodak, and, and uh, one of the, the uh, process historians, uh, I, I contact regularly. It's like, have you seen this? Like, nope, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, do you know how to do this? Like, nope, nope. Okay, I guess I'm on my own. So I'm doing this from a ground like a basis that that doesn't exist. Yeah. So I'm getting better, uh, and like as I get better, as I actually hone my craft and have more skills, I have. It's just like um. Painting. I just I just found the blue brush. Yeah. I, can make, I can make blue stuff now. Mm -hmm. uh, I it, it's um, so now my your question was you know how does it speak to my my um, my artwork? Uh, it's constantly evolving because I'm finding more tools. Yeah. Um, I, I I it's like you know when you're a kid and your your parents give you like Crayola crayons, mm -hmm. and it's like and you go to your 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 friend's house and they're like hey let's color stuff oh cool and they they bust out the box of like ninety six colors. Right. Like, whoa, 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 time out. Oh, my box has 16 colors. Where the heck did you get these other colors? Oh, you know, yep. like that. It's like, whoa, green. green. We, we can do green now. I guess, <laughs> I guess that's the yeah. thing. And we're going we're gonna to work with it. So to answer your question, it's like it's constantly evolving because there's new tools coming in, in my, uh, my repertoire. Yeah. Have, has, have these works um, for other... I, I would say tin type photographers or other people who are uh, currently practicing and, and keeping a uh, such a such a much older version of photography sustained 
in this day. I know the tools and, and the process, while roughly the same, the tools have kind of evolved a little bit. But how has this inspired other Tintype users to want to pursue completely different methods based on some of the things that you have pioneered? I, it's a hard question because um, like I bet you 99% of the people who do Tintypes and Amber types um, want to do the traditional historic method of portraiture or landscapes um, and, and be, I mean, they're very, they're very um, tied to the, the history. They, they want to use the wet plate uh, collodion camera from 1860. Oh. Wow. And they want to use the you know the Darlow lens from thirty nine, the historic one, not, not a replica. Like they they go on eBay and they like hunt this stuff down and they find the, the actual lens. And they want to use they, they don't like I, I use uh, aluminum back plates and they want to use the traditional iron plates and they call it uh, they put a, a black varnish on it and they bake them in the oven. It's like I I, I buy the substrates you know. Like, um, they're, they're so like, uh, and this is true for anyone who collects or does anything. You want to be like a purist. True. Sure. Ninety nine percent of the people are not that extreme of the purists, but they're ninety nine percent are purists to basically doing ten types historically. Mm -hmm. I'm on the other end. I'm 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 an experimental photographer. I I, I don't want to do portraiture. Uh, I don't want to do landscape. Uh, I want to invent my own media. Um, I want to um, explore this fully and see where it takes me. So, Absolutely. yeah, no one really wants to do what I do. I mean, there's always a subset because there's you know, 2,000, 10 typists. There's always, you know, a, hand, a dozen or two saying, hey, how do you do this? It's like, wow, I don't really want to teach workshops yet, but, you know, point them kind of in that direction. Yeah. I wonder I wonder if this would be a really great opportunity, if you're all open to it, to um, take a little tour of your dark room. Sure, I produced that video. Uh, yeah, I think Derek has it. Yeah, yeah. I feel like we should um, jump to this so everyone can see a little bit more about what you're talking about because it it really is like Frankenstein basement situation with all kinds <laughs> of wild things happening. It's it's the process is so cool and and your intersection of science and um, personal experience and artistic values to all in this is it's so amazing. So I'm so glad that you've made this for everyone to see. Yeah. yeah, I basically had I've had I built six at least six different dark rooms, and each one's gone through at least a dozen renovations. I mean, I've, I've kind of evolved them. Now it's like it's like you said, it's Frankenstein's dark room. It's basically it. there's there's stuff there's crap hanging from the ceilings because I don't want to walk. It's basically I want my 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 goal is to take one step in every direction. You want a paper towel? I have a roll of paper towels hanging in the ceiling. I want a pen. They're hanging from pens. The pens I are hanging. I saw that. I feel like I want to do that for myself somehow. And then everyone's going to think I'm crazy because I have no reason to be so uh, functional. But, it's, you know. It's like how efficient could you be as a, as a cook? If you're if you're in the kitchen and you had someone just like 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 in surgery, uh, I'll take the chopping knife, please. And you just you don't have to walk. You don't have to step anywhere. Just right there. Uh, the lights are have hanging. I, they're all remote control. I can I have six lights and they're red lights, different versions of red lights and then white lights. Uh, different versions of different wavelengths of white lights. So I can just push them on. Like I just want to dial in the wavelength. Oh, that's what I want. Don't have to walk anywhere. It's insane to walk across the room to flip a light switch. <laughs> it's madness. <laughs> it's so old school. I, I love that. Um, I'll say to our viewers while I, because uh, I would, I just want to make sure that our our mics are okay when we kind of change things over. So I'm going to throw up a quick be right back screen while I adjust that, and then we'll be back in like five seconds to, to take a look at this dark room tour. So uh, don't go anywhere, viewers. Uh, just give us a sec here. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, it's like um, <laughs> it's sh it's shocking to me to see my own workspace. It's like um, <laughs> yeah, um, 
it's it's actually part of the creative process. It's like uh, I mean, there's a lot of there's, there's organization over there actually, but there's there's a lot of uh, lots of times stuff works because it's it's in front of me. Mm-hmm. You know, you're making spaghetti and you like you actually right. put in a little bit of cinnamon and it works out great. <laughs> what do you think of that? Like, well, I had it in my hand, you know. Yep. Um, I did turn the volume down so that we can continue our conversation on top of. Um, if you yeah, just stop, stop me where you want to. I'll, I'll, if you have a question, we can talk about it. Yeah, the the sound does explain what you're doing, but maybe if you want to explain instead. Yes. Yeah, so, so this is a a, a ten type plate that you buy actually from a, a suburb of Chicago. It's called Main Trophy Supply, and most people buy theirs from Main Trophy Supply. There's other suppliers, but this is th- these people supply like ninety percent of the ten types for all the the ten type artists. Okay. And the, there's there's a little blue piece of masking tape. Mm. Yeah. I, I just to hear that on there because there's a plastic coating. It's a protective coating, and you can put a piece of masking tape on there. Oh yeah, if you put play, he shows how that works actually. Yeah, you just it, it's just um, in the back is aluminum, and the the black is uh, a powder coated um, or enameled like plastic coating on it. Mm-hmm. And it's very uniform. It's, it's they're perfectly flat. It's easy to cut uh, if you have the right like blade, right to, like a. a Okay. A metal cutting metal shear to break, break it, beat it up, or to, yeah. to to chop it up. And I notice you're wearing you're wearing gloves. So it is, and you mentioned that this is like a, a chemical process. And so, are, are there any um, dangers that come with using any of the chemicals uh, involved in tintype? Uh, so, sometimes there are, uh, but you know, I use, I use the gloves because I get them from my lab at the university. So, mm-hmm. um, uh, and, and I'm just practicing good, you know, lab practices uh yeah. i'm using chemicals that are oh what's uh, this oh yeah we can oh that's that's actually clodium it's kind of old because it's red but it's it's uh it's actually from bostic and sullivan i don't usually use a pre-mixed uh clodium because it's i usually make it myself but if in a pinch i'm in a hurry you can just buy this from a, a supply store in new mexico in santa fe called bostic and sullivan and um you can buy a pre-mix or you can buy it in a kit. We just mix two things together. So you don't have to think about chemistry. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's um, a quick, and I use a lab media, a media storage bottle. Uh, What's but, this? but for the chemicals, you know, I use, for example, one of the developers is iron sulfate. I, I buy it. It's root killer, you know, buy it at Ace Hardware. Oh boy. So it's basically, you know, yeah. what you use in the house anyway. So most of what I use is stuff that's food grades, um, chemicals that you I buy at, at uh, Ace Hardware or grocery stores and things like that. Yeah, this is this is stellar. That is a cool device. Now, what does <laughs> that take care of? So, so that's that's an old traditional um, darkroom and larger. Okay. At the top of that, there's a light bulb, and under the light bulb are these giant glass lenses that focus They're, they collimate this light into a giant column of light and you put a a, a, a negative remember the old negatives <laughs> those yeah. acetate plastic negatives you put that underneath the column of light and light shines through the negative and projects the image your your po- your negative or your positive onto your uh wow onto your plate so i'm just commandeering that i don't use the negative anymore mm-hmm. i use it as a, ver- a good way to um measure the amount of light that goes on to these 10 types before I put the developers on. Yeah, so Michael, I don't, I don't know if I ever told you, but for the my duration at DePaul, I worked in the dark rooms the entire time. Awesome. Yeah, so I, I'm like always looking at what you're doing and marveling. And also I remember what it means to have your hands always smell like fixer and, you know, the gloves are <laughs> they're crucial. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Plus, get the gloves that go, you know, up up your wrist, not the yeah. ones in pool, because oh, there's always stuff that goes under there. So get the longer gloves. Yeah. Yeah. And so, is the are these some of the works that you were currently working on there that were sitting, sitting on the table? Um, I don't know. Maybe you can scrub to find out where. Well, that's we right. I think we'll go. Yeah, and you put it in the in the the bath. What do you rinse it in? It takes a bath in something, right? The. Oh, so after you know, after I put developers on, so I have a I have a, a pipette, an auto pipette, a transfer pipette. It's a it's a long cylindrical thing, has a plunger on top, and it delivers exactly. You can dial in exactly how many microliters you want, what tenth of a milliliter or hundred, you know, exactly the volume you want. Mm-hmm. And you pl- push the plunger down, and it delivers the, the the developer onto these plates, and that's how I get these fractal patterns. Oh, interesting. Really, I got to wash them. I, I wash them, and to the left in the sink, there's a. Uh, 
Oh yeah. Here I have a developer that I'm using a syringe. I'm actually painting with the syringe. I'm just like, just in the dark, this is in light right now. Mm -hmm. Video is in light, but when I'm doing this, it's in dark. It's under amber safe light. I have a syringe in one hand and I'm praying and I'm holding the tent type in the other hand and I'm just squirting this on and not knowing what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Oh, here's your contraption for the lights. So this is off of like Amazon or eBay. It's, there's two remote controls and I put little black dots for the black and white lights and red dots for the yellow lights. So I'm just showing that you push a button and the, the red light comes on. That way you don't have to like, I can control, you know, up to like 10 lights, but I have like six lights I can control. You're giving yeah. lots of ideas on how to be lazy and I really, really like it. I love it. I love it. I, I also try to as best I can surround myself with all the things that I commonly use. I, I'm very lucky to say that I, I don't tread far from my desk, um, but to, to see everything in its convenience, I, it, this is, to me, this is genius to, to be like, of course I would put uh, these light switches here and, and markers handy. Like where else are you going to find them if you're in the dark? And That's very true. Searching around. Yeah. Yeah, in the dark you can't find it because uh, there's little pads. These are actually see the the yellow, the orange, or the the pink and the blue pads. Yeah. They're actually masks for the shower. Oh, clever! So your water bath is a chafing dish too. Is that what yeah, you? That's, said? A, that's a chafing dish basically. I love it. It's, it's the reason because it's well it's stainless steel, so it doesn't stain. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the the plastic ones get trashed all the time. And they're cheaper. They're a lot cheaper. Darkroom stuff, even though you, you can go on eBay and buy darkroom stuff for like nothing because, you know, darkroom stuff is not being used anymore. It's still more expensive than if you go to Amazon or go to your, to a, a I went to a, a supply store, yeah, uh, a restaurant supply store, and you can buy chafing dishes for like six bucks. I love it. Wow. That was, that was going to be one of my questions is noticing uh, how many different supplies and materials that make up uh, this darkroom. It, for I know in your development process, there's a lot uh, different things that are going into it. But is Tintype as a whole, I would, is that a large financial hurdle for for somebody to get into, even if they wanted to get into it casually? Um, not really. It's, it's it's like everything. If you want to be an expert at everything, it's incredibly expensive. Yeah. If you want to like see if you like it, it's pretty cheap. Oh. I mean, you can put the silver nitrate in a tray, and you can do tray. You can do tray sensitization. You don't have to have. You you can do the stuff. You know. You know. My first dark room was in an old bathroom. Oh, nice. Um, my, my, my three dark rooms ago was in a shed in the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's you're seeing the evolution of six different um, major, you know, transitions into a, being a professional dark room. Yeah. So, yeah. Is it expensive? Yeah. If you want to do what I'm doing. Um, you know, I'm a working artist, so I, I can't, I can't um, make mistakes technically. I can't, I can't, I, you know, bad craftsmen blame their tools. I don't blame my tools. I just get better tools. Yeah. Yeah. Well, knowing we have about 10 minutes left, um, let's jump. Oh, I love that blue. I love, I can't wait to see these. Are these, okay. So just to make sure we kind of get the idea about what you're up to right now, is this part of the Hibakusha series? And can you tell us about the Hibakusha series? Um, yes. Yeah, so, so in the Catherine Emily Gatley, um, there are 17 pieces of art in a, in a, in a very intimate setting. It's all painted black. It's a, it's a video room. It, it's uh, and, and these 10 types, these Hibakusha 10 types are all pure silver, no color, barely any color. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw one in that right there. in, in that's in this, uh, the screenshot it has a little bit of blue but i purposely left out almost all the color mm -hmm. and these 17 pieces you know there's like 22 plates because one piece has is a triptych has has three panels side by side right and this one is a giant diptych there it's uh 18 inches tall by uh 12 inches wide so it's 18 by 24. wow uh, all of those if you count it as one piece there's 17 pieces all put together into a into a in the series and that series is at the Catherine Ellen gallery in their video room, that's all plain and black. It's just, it's just uh, Kathy is just. Uh, I I I, uh, I make fun of her and say she's an art sommelier. <laughs> she, she she can take a piece and say no, no. I say it's it's heartbreaking. Like I almost killed myself for that piece. Like no, <laughs> oh, this one yes, this one yes. This goes here and like this goes, this stays, and she just creates 
wonder she creates and the lighting she created for this and it's like i have to put a give her a lot of credit because it's like that i'm trying not to be too boastful but my work looks really really good under that lighting I it, can it re reflects that silver matte finish yeah. so well that um it's quite an experience it's um it's an emotional experience yeah. <laughs> Oh, I think we, I think we may have, um, you, you know, she, her ears were ringing when you spoke of her because she's asking a question. Um, she, this is, I'm guessing, uh, Kathy Edelman here saying, oh, yes, yeah. what, <laughs> with a lot of smiles, uh, what did you think of the recent articles about Hibakusha is the question. It's awesome. Uh, you know, I've read a lot over again. I've read some new stuff because every, like Derek was saying, every year at this time in August, you know, the first week of August, people are producing their articles. Mm -hmm. uh, so Kathy is um, chatting right now saying, what do I think about it? She sent me an article and it was, uh, it was an awesome, uh, again, I like different um, strange viewpoints, different angles. And it was a viewpoint of an American. Is it Bill Jacobs? Um, who, of Japanese descent, but was left in, J in Japan during the Hiroshima atomic bomb blast. Mm -hmm. And I haven't heard of that before. So of course I loved it because it's a different version of the story yeah. that I have not heard before. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually he survived obviously because he's telling his story through, the, I think it's, um, I don't know if it's the New York Times or if it was uh, the Atlantic, but uh, I, I don't remember the source. Uh, but it's a very interesting article about uh, an American citizen of Japanese de de uh, descent that was in Hiroshima mm -hmm. uh, as the atomic bomb uh, detonated uh, over over the city. Yeah, I was I was asking. There was an article that's been spinning around in my circles quite a bit lately from a gentleman I, I just adore who works um, out of Hiroshima City University and the Peace Institute from Bo Jacobs. And I wondered if that's who the what you were all talking like. Oh my gosh, did that really get around? But um, also a good one. And I I want to read this one too. This is so cool because Kathy notes this from the L.A. Times. Yeah, it was the L.A. Times. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, we have maybe five minutes left for questions and anything that um, anyone's curious about. Um, I To note, the last time I was able to hang out with um, Michael and talk about his artwork was actually at the Kathy Edelman Gallery when it was downtown. But Derek and I have no excuse that the gallery is actually quite close to where we live now. And we need to get out to see this exhibition. It looks amazing. And whenever you paint a whole room black, I'm pretty much already halfway there. So <laughs> I really can't wait to go. <laughs> I told you, once there's black involved, we're there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I don't want to be too boastful again, but it's like, um, it's, it's a moving experience in that scenario. I mean, Kathy put together an, ama an amazing, like, sensory experience. She just mm -hmm. does that. Uh, if you ever see her booths when she goes to art fairs, and um, she's exhibited my work at uh, Photo London, uh, also at um, I'm just very privileged to have her uh, um, representing me. She's uh, brought my work to APAD, which is in in New York City, the biggest uh, uh, photography show, mm -hmm. and also in Chicago, Chicago Expo, and right. also in, in in Art Basel in, in Miami. Right. When, right. You see, when you see her booths that she puts together, it's just it's it's a uh, it's quite an undertaking. Uh, Julie Lowe and um, Kathy Adelman put together an amazing space, amazing space. It's like, like I'm a big foodie, so when I see like Top Chef and they have these uh, restaurant wars, mm. they create a restaurant space out of nothing. It's like, yeah. it's like that, it's, it's, it's uh, quite an experience. So she put together this huge emotional experience in her own gallery in the video room downstairs of all these plates. Um, and I got to say, just got to say that she did a good job is that the lighting is just phenomenal. Well, I wonder in our last minutes together, if thinking about this current exhibition that you have on view and this, this moment that we're all sharing 75 years later and kind of, um, where we're at in the world right now, all these things, how, if I could ask such a personal question, how are you feeling on this particular occasion and in this moment in time, making the work that you're making and. I just wonder what your current perspective is if you're interested in sharing it. Uh, to be honest, you know, I'm, I'm feeling pretty defeated. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's um, not going the direction that I, I think any of us really want. I, mm -hmm. I don't think our safety has, is, has advanced. Uh, I'm talking about nuclear safety. And I'm sure, you know, you, know, you uh, Professor Miyamoto and, and, and Matt are going to talk about this later on the show. And I'm itching to hear about 
and I won't steal their thunder, but uh, we're going the wrong direction. Um, it, it's it's slow progress, just hacking at the weeds, and then you turn the corner of out of all these weeds you've hacked down, and you turn the corner of the building and realize, holy crap, there's seven more acres. Yeah. Um, we just we just there's just too just too much to 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 deal with, but you, you just have to um, chip in. You just have to like, you know, put your put your head down and 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 be a advocate for peace. It's it's strange for me to say that. I'll, I'll you know I'm happy to go further, but I'll, I'm going to end my little rant here. It's um, it's stupid to say you have to be an advocate for peace. You mean there's people who aren't advocates for peace? And this is, yeah, there's people that are not advocates for peace. Mm -hmm. That's bizarre to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah, and I think that um, in some of the conversations that I, I've i been thinking about having today and thinking about this coming up and um, what activism looks like when you're an advocate or activism, what is really the difference? And you know, how do these mediums really help um, address some of this indifference or some of the things that you're talking about. And um, when you're talking about, you know, just doing the work, I, I, I hope you feel that we all appreciate the work that you're doing and, and, and see all of the wonderful things that, that you're creating to um, help people understand and, and educate, because I think I personally feel that that's the best way, but yeah. Well, I got to thank you, lastly, for you know giving me this voice. I mean, giving this opportunity to to come on and, and say just say just say anything. You know, say what I work, what I'm working on, what I stand for, and, and being so welcome. You guys are you know so comforting and, and so warm. Uh, I feel like I'm amongst you know I found my tribe. Hmm. Well, I feel the same. I honestly, every time I hope we can have Michael on again because I'm sure as you all feel now, he's so easy to talk to and. And we could just talk for hours because he's so insightful and has so many compelling things to say. Um, ooh. Sarah's like my PR person. <laughs> um, I, this is what I'm saying is like, everyone says, well, you really love Japanese art, yada, yada. Like, why are you not an artist? I'm a terrible artist, but I, I think that what I'm good at is loving things. And gosh, I'm so in love with this. This is, your work is amazing. And I'm just so grateful. We actually do have a question though, so I can stop talking. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, Photography Bonsai says, I miss some of the talk. Um, does Michael mention any reasons for going with this tin type method over something else? Yeah, it's an awesome question. That's a really good question. And it was a really well thought out on my part because I wanted something that lasts virtually forever. Mm. And uh, I just showed you a tin type earlier in the show. It's like, that's from, 19, it's from 1860. It's easy yeah. to jump and say 1960. It's from 1860. And it is as good as it looked like when it was formed, you know, 150 years ago. Yeah. And, and I, uh, no, nothing against paper, you know, photograph processes are often on paper, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I wanted something to be permanent and unique. So I can't, my artwork, when you, when, when it's sold, it's, it goes off to, into someone's collection. And I, you know, someone says, I want, I want another one like that. Like, I can't make one like that. That, mm -hmm. that was the one. Yeah. So is it, so the reason why ten ties because it's a unique piece of work. It's like a sculpture. Uh, it doesn't come from a mold. It's like, I don't know how I can't make another one mm -hmm. exactly the same way. And it's going to last for, you know, centuries and counting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Placing that in the context of, um, you know, yourself being a Habaksha and, and already expressing your, um, you know, the lifetime that you've had so far in, in, in creating these works, it adds uh, such a, a vast and deep layer of, um, uh, meaning and, and context to the works. The fact that you are intended on them lasting forever, I find that to be incredible. And um, I can't wait to, to have a look at them. Good. Yeah, I, I welcome you too. It's, uh, yeah, you got no excuse now. You have to go. Yeah. I know. I'm like, I'm shaming you into this. <laughs> That's the worst thing I could do. No, no, we're, we're here for it. We're, we're, we're already here for <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Um, well, it, it, I wanted to thank you again. We have so many more things to talk about this evening. And, and um, our to our viewers at home, absolutely don't go anywhere because there will be more conversations. Um, hopefully, Michael, you'll be uh, hanging out with us when we talk to um, Professor Miyamoto and and, um, and Matt as well, uh, it, because I'm, I can't wait to hear how all of this comes together, uh, even 
even deeper. And uh, sorry, Sarah, you look to hear about the. To no, say no, I, I I second everything you're saying, Derek. Of course, and and also just to note that before we um, leave, Michael. Um, to note that his new exhibition, Hibaksha, is on display at Catherine Edelman Gallery. The address is not on the top of my tongue right now, but how long will it be on display? Until September 4th. So another September. month, almost another month, four more weeks. Okay, great. So yeah, um, I, sure. I'm sure that there's some safe um, protocols in place at Catherine Edelman Gallery. And if you are in the neighborhood and you'd like to stop by and see some of his work in person, I can't. I can't um, recommend it enough. It, I mean, the images we're showing, they really, your photographs photograph well, is that is that a thing? Um, but they really do look so lovely even in the digital format, but in person, they're, they're really something, so. Yes, yeah. Um, oh, so viewers, our, our next segment, segment, excuse me, our next segment uh, coming up, we have uh, another um, very cool bit, uh, kind of a, a small pivot, but it all comes together, we promise. Uh, we will soon be bringing on Tai Yamamoto, who is an origami crane uh, folding artist, as, uh, as well as an artist in general, practicing film and, and so on. Uh, we can't wait for you to uh, get to hear from them as well. Uh, so stick around. We'll be right back and uh, have some more conversations for you. Uh, yeah. please, say, please say bye to Michael and, and uh, hopefully seeing you. I got work. <laughs> so we'll be right back. Let's see.
All righty. Um, okay, cool. Making sure everybody's here and active. Um, we are now back. We have another guest with us. Um, again, I said that that's Tai Yamamoto. Uh, and I want, Sarah, you're like way more talented than me at introducing guests and, and speaking about all of their wonderful talents uh, before passing the torch to said individual. Um, it, could, could you tell us a little bit about Tai? I'm happy to. <laughs> We're watching Ty just be a magician right now. So, um, yeah. So this is Ty Yamamoto, who um, I've come to know through this large community that we'll be kind of talking to all over the place tonight. Um, Ty is going to be teaching um, origami classes for the Japanese Culture Center, and uh, they are origami artists themselves. So. Um, they are here to show us how to fold a crane, among other things. Ty's going to be with us all night doing all kinds of cool stuff. So hang on and hang tight to hear all those things. And while I introduce Ty, I just want to let everyone know that this is also us introducing a big project we're all doing together. Um, right now, we're folding a crane. And maybe Ty can kind of explain the um, significance and importance of the crane. If, if you're open to that, if you're not comfortable, I can do it too. But um, what we're asking is um, if you have origami paper with you now, or if you have any square piece of paper, this is the time, grab that piece of paper. So you can make it square just by folding a rectangular piece if you need to. Um, but yeah, there's. we will also have this to um, as a reference too. So don't feel pressured to fold it in the moment. We will have all these instructions for you posted on our social media too. So you can just watch if you want. Yes. That being said, um, where's my paper? Oh, right. So what we're doing all together today um, is we will be folding, as I rip my paper for you all, this is great. Um, we're gonna be folding a crane. Everyone will fold one, hopefully, please. And what we're doing is in Japan, there is this um, tradition called the omamori, and it looks like this. It's a little charm that you buy at a temple um, when you have um, any kind of uh, uh, wish or hope or, or, or worry, things like this. They fill a lot of needs. And then the inside of one of these, I think sometimes people haven't had this explained to them, and I think it's problematic. You're not supposed to open it. <laughs> uh -huh. Don't open it. Inside, there's a little charm, and there's um, some sutra or something written by the temple that you bought it from. Um, but what we're doing today is something like a crane omamori, something that we're doing um, where we're going to write one of our own wishes, our own hopes, anything that is on your mind right now as we're in this state, kind of doing this separately, but all together. So if you all, as you fold your crane, and Ty will talk you through all of these things in minute detail, but write something on the inside. It can be something you're hoping for, something you're wishing for, a worry you wanna let go of, whatever it happens to be, go ahead and write that on the inside and you're gonna fold that inside your crane. No one will see it. But then once you've finished your crane and you can make as many as you'd like for as many people as you like, um, we're gonna ask you to send those to us or drop them off to us at the culture center, the Japanese culture center. And we are going to install every single one of the cranes that you all fold in a um, public um, space or more than one, probably in a storefront so you can walk up and see them safely. So we're hoping to string all of your hopes, all of your dreams, all of your thoughts all together. And it'll be a really lovely public art installation. And we've been talking a lot about art plus activism and art and activism um, and what that looks like. And we wanted to give everyone a chance to actually participate in some forms of activism with us. So. Um, I'll let Crane or Crane Ty. Um, <laughs> I'll let Ty uh, explain the crane um, and why we'd be doing this at all, and also um, to introduce um, himself a little bit further too. Thank you so much, Ty. We're so happy to have you. Of course, it's great to be here. Um, yeah. So just briefly, um, this crane is a symbol of peace, um, especially the origami crane. Um, it said that if you fold a thousand cranes, you will receive a wish. Um, and there's a story of, oh gosh, I'm forgetting, what is the girl's name? Sadako. Uh, Sadako, yes. Um, who, um, gosh, I'm so bad at the story. Sarah, do you mind recapping the story? I don't mind at all. I'm so happy to. This is a book that my mother read to me when I was very small. So it's pretty Same weird. Here. <laughs> yeah. You read it in school. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is a little girl who um, survived the atomic bombings, um, but um, so could also be considered a hibaksha, but except for um, sometime um, shortly after the bomb, she developed cancer and um, developed her own side effects from being exposed to that radiation. 
um, and unfortunately passed away. But uh, during her um, time in the hospital, uh, she was um, tapping into this tradition of folding cranes, Senba Zuru, to fold 100, 100 cranes. She folded so many more than that, though. Um, and she was taking little bits of napkin from um, anything and making cranes that were so small because she'd run out of paper. Her classmates also folded cranes for her, and she was um, um, buried with them, actually. And so the, uh, the Peace Park in Hiroshima holds cranes that any class anyone can submit and send to them and they will put them on display in the peace park there because the crane is kind of ubiquitous for this um active um, um expression of peace for folding cranes um but yeah sadako and the thousand paper cranes um, is anyone else out there familiar with this book and this story we're happy to hear your thoughts on it but i will turn it back over to ty yeah, thank you so much for telling the story. You said it much better than I ever could. Um, <laughs> even though I've heard it and read it so many times, it's just, um, yeah, it's always in my head. <laughs> um, for a brief introduction on me, um, I'm a recent uh, graduate of the film and television program from DePaul University. Um, I also um, minored in Japanese studies um, and had a lot of awesome classes and uh, met a lot of awesome people, including uh, Yuki Miyamoto, who will be in the show later and who introduced me to Tokyo House Party. Um, but yeah, I'm a Chicago-based filmmaker, photographer, general artist. I do all sorts of things, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier. Um, I will be doing origami classes for the JCC uh, later this month and uh, throughout this fall. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very excited. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank yeah, you so I'm much. excited to have you. <laughs> Super excited. I Earlier, I, I very hastily, I, I got my square ready because I, I had some for like prepped and ready for this, and I have no idea where they went. I even had like some backups in case I messed up. But uh, I'm super excited. Uh, so uh, for anybody who has uh, just stepped in, I know um, hopefully most of our viewers have been with us since the beginning. But if you're if you're just not getting here um, and you're brand new to Tokyo House Party, uh, we are always bringing on um, artists, experts, hobbyists, people from all sorts of backgrounds to talk about their knowledge and expertise in various fields. And so I, we hope that you'll participate with us today um and making a crane with us um ty would it be a good time now to to switch over to the camera view for you oh uh, yeah that'd be perfect okay let's transition over i'll send that the magic of the internet yeah <laughs> yeah and our viewers at home should be able to see yeah i think that's i think that's working out for everybody we'll take it away i will i'm not gonna talk anymore <laughs> All right. Uh, perfect. So I will um, do this as best as I can. Um, feel free to jump in and um, ask questions if anything uh, pops up. Um, so first off, uh, I have the colored side of my paper up right now. Uh, if you can't see that, one side is white, one side is colored. If both your uh, sides of the paper are one color, that is totally fine. Uh, just make sure that you're following with like the correct idea in mind. Um, so first off, we're going to fold it in half, like a triangle, uh, with the white side up, if that makes sense. Uh, if you've ever done origami, this is probably going to feel very familiar. Uh, from here, you're going to unfold this, and then you're going to fold it in half, like a triangle again, the other way. After that, you're going to open it up, flip it around. Uh, for me, this is going to be the white side of the paper, but for you, it may be different. Uh, from there, you're going to fold it in half like a rectangle. And if you're familiar with origami, uh, you're going to recognize what is known as a square base, which is the first thing that we are creating here. Um, there's a lot of different bases in origami um, that are used to make a lot of similar ideas. Uh, for example, the bird base, which we're going to be making, is what's used to make cranes and a lot of other uh, birds, ostriches, emus, all sorts of things. Mm, cool. And so after you fold it in half and fold it, uh, fold it into a rectangle again the other way. Um, so at this point, you should have roughly four lines intersecting your paper. So if you open it up, you're going to have one here, here, and then two diagonal lines to form this kind of star shape in your paper. The next step is a little bit tricky for people, and there's many different ways of explaining it. Um, but the way that I like to explain it is that you're kind of going to be collapsing all the folds we just did in on each other. So if you look at me, and I'll do this a couple times so you can see, 
Uh, we're going to be taking the corners here and pinching inward to create a smaller square, which I know looks like magic. And to a lot of people who first do origami, uh, this is definitely a tricky step. So definitely take your time with it um, and figure out your own way to kind of do it. There's not one way to origami, um, despite what it may, despite the fact that it may seem counterintuitive. Um, there's a lot of different ways to get to the same place, and everyone does it a different way. I love that um, time. So it, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll show it one more time. Um, I'll try and do it a couple different ways because everybody seems to wrap their head around this in a, in a different way. Um, another way to do this is to fold it back into your rectangle shape like this, and then lift up these corners, and then start folding in on the lines that you've created. Um, if that doesn't make sense, let me know in the comments and I'll find another way to explain it. But essentially what you'll be doing is folding on all the lines that we created and bringing it into a square like this. Cool. So once you get to this step, which is known as a square base, you're going to start folding up the corners to meet the middle. Um, so it's important here that the open side of the square is facing downwards. So you can see all the flaps down here. And what we're going to do is if you see the center line down the middle, we're going to fold this edge to the middle line, just like this. And you're going to repeat that on the other sides as well. And then once you have both folds uh, folded to the center line, uh, flip it over and do that again. Uh, origami is a lot of repetition and doing a lot of steps over and over, um, which can definitely be patience trying at times, but ends up being really satisfying for me at least. Um, I find a lot of fun in it. Mm -hmm. So the end product is kind of look like a kite. Again, in case you need it, uh, the folds are just taking these edge lines to the center line, just like this. It'll be the same on both sides. Uh, after that, what you're going to do is fold the whole top down on this line here. So you're going to pull this corner. So you're kind of folding on the line created by these two flaps here, the top of these two flaps. So in origami, there's a lot of different guidelines that we create that make it easier to uh, fold onto the folds that we need. And that's kind of what we've been doing here. So when you see a lot of unfolding and folding in origami, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, so you're going to unfold the top here, and then unfold the two flaps. So you're back to kind of the square shape. And then once you do that, you're going to peel up the bottom corner, the bottom edge, fold up on the line that we just created on top. And this is another tricky step, so don't worry if you don't get it right away. And you're going to fold inwards on these lines that we created before. And you're going to fold upwards as well on this part up here um, to create what is known as a bird base. It kind of just looks like a diamond shape. So I'll do that again really quick just to make sure everyone got it. Um, but it's going to look like this, where we're going to be folding on all these lines we just created. So you start by pulling up the flap and then flattening down on the folds that we did earlier. And then once you've done that, um, I like to fold this flap down and make it back into kind of a square shape or a kite shape. Um, and that just helps me to kind of like know where I'm at uh, step-wise. <laughs> After that, you're just going to flip it over um, and pretty much just do the same thing that we just did. So once you've done these few steps um, on both sides, it's going to be essentially just one flat 
uh, piece of paper. There's not going to be any folds. There's not going to be any extra creases. There's going to be a couple of lines here that you can see from the guides that we did earlier. Um, it's going to be like that on both sides. Um, and this step right here is what's known as the bird base, because from this shape, you can pretty much make any kind of bird. Um, and you'll see how we do that once we start folding up the legs and head of the crane. Um, so go ahead and lift up the flap again. And what you're going to do, and this time make sure that the side, make sure that the side with this one unopened corner is on top, and that the side with these, what are going to be the legs are on bottom. And from there, what you're going to do. Ty, could you slow down just a touch, actually? Oh yes, of course. My we bad. We've been asking for for just a touch, a touch slow down. Yes, of course. Everyone uh, learns at their own pace, so there's no one way to do this or one correct pace. And just to remind everyone too, um, Ty is going to help us make some step by step directions that we will share with you after the show. So if you aren't able to keep up at this moment, there is no pressure. It is it is mm -hmm. a skill for sure, and it's something you improve as you fold them. So. Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've taught cranes to so many people um, just throughout life, and it's always um, it's always interesting to see. Like, some people pick it up right away, some people take more time, but everybody always gets it in the end. The nice thing about origami is that while we're all folding and striving for the same thing, everyone puts their own flair on it, and everyone has their own take on the same traditional patterns that have existed for so long. Um, I always think that's really beautiful to see how everyone kind of makes it their own, even though it's something that seems so standardized. Mm -hmm, yeah. Totally. Okay, so once we're at this step here, what we're going to do is fold this edge to the middle line, similar to what we were doing before, but it's going to be even tighter this time. So it's going to start to get hard, because the more you make folds, uh, the stiffer the paper becomes. And it's going to look just like this. And we're going to repeat that on the other side as well. So once you've done that on that side, what you're going to just do is flip it over and do the same thing. So lift up the flap and then fold the center line once again. So once you get to this step, uh, both sides should be pretty skinny at this point. Um, and you should have kind of a little triangle shape formed here by some of the folds that we did. So this next step is a little tricky again. Um, so if you need any help or guidance, let me know. If you need me to slow down. What we're going to do is we're going to pull these legs up to create the head and the tail of the crane. So how to do this, um, I'll actually give two different ways to do this. Um, so the first way is to create a guideline for yourself, which is a bit make, might make it a bit easier, and just fold this leg upward. And this step is not super strict. You can kind of fold it to your taste level. Um, some people like to make their legs, and some people like to make the tail of the head crane and the head a bit longer. Some people make it a bit shorter. Um, that's really up to you, however you want to do it. Um, and so once you do that, uh, unfold it. Uh, and that's going to be the guideline, because what we're going to do is open up this side of the crane, and we're going to we're going to pull the leg or the head, the tail or the head upwards. And then you're going to fold it in on itself like this. I'll do that again because it's a tricky step. But essentially what it is, is just is just pulling the leg up and folding on that line that we just created. And then folding inwards to flatten out the tail or the head, whatever it becomes. 
And we're going to do that on the other side as well. So fold it upwards to create your guideline. Unfold it. Open up this little side here. And then fold upwards. And then close it in. And flatten it out. If anyone needs to see that again, let me know. I'd be more than happy to show it again. Um, so one thing that happens here is that almost always, at least when I'm making a crane, uh, one of these sides looks a little prettier than the other. I always like to take the one that looks uh, less pretty and turn that one into the head. <laughs> and to do that, um, you're going to do a similar thing to what we just did. You're going to fold it down, unfold it, open it up, and fold it in on itself and close it to flatten it. And we're almost done with the crane here. So now you can kind of see we have the tail and we have the head. And then from here, we're just going to fold down the wings, one side, and then the other. Kind of open them up a little bit. And you're done. Oh, nice. Look at that. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. Oh, Again, uh, oh, we'll be sharing directions. So if you don't love your first crane, you can fold <laughs> so many more and send them all to us because we will install all of them. So the sky's the limit, friends. Don't forget to. Um, keep your cranes and we will find um, another avenue to share with you about where they will be displayed and how we'll be installing them. But we really hope that you'll all do it and, and send us some of your work. And Ty's gonna be back again um, in another hour or so to talk about the next origami project that involves City Pop. So that's gonna be a, a really cool one too. You don't wanna miss out on that. Ty, do you have any other sentiments or, or Words of wisdom to pass along to our origami folding friends. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Just to, if you didn't get it on this time, just keep going. Um, I know I didn't get my first crane right. It takes a lot of practice to like make them look nice. <laughs> yeah, my, uh, my take all kinds. Crane heads a little, we'll, we'll say, um, unique, and <laughs> and it's and it's we'll call it shapely. That's what we'll do. Mm -hmm. My crane head. <laughs> So, I also you. wanted to note too that um, we have a really um, lovely person from the consulate's office who has volunteered to fold a crane for you if for any reason you find that that's um, um, not something you um, can do or for whatever reason it's um, not an ability you have to fold a crane. So um, if you need help folding a crane um, and you want to submit a sentiment to us or just to have your name written in the inside, please um, reach out to us on Instagram. That's the best place. And we will um, fold one on your behalf too. So it'd be lovely to have the cranes that you fold, but if for any reason you can't fold a crane, please let us know. We are here for that. Absolutely. Um, Ty, I want to thank you again for the, the demonstration. And of course. Um, before we let you go, uh, can you tell our viewers if they want to keep up with you online and uh, follow it, not only your artwork in, in origami, but film and, and et cetera, uh, where can they find you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I think on the screen, you can see my Instagram handle, which is Tai underscore Yamamoto one. I post photos there. Um, and then on my Instagram bio, you can find my Vimeo link if you want to check out any of my short film projects uh, and whatnot. Thanks so much, Tai. Uh, to mm -hmm. our viewers at home, we'll be right back once again, so don't go anywhere uh, because we have the uh, another portion to our show uh, where we'll be circling back from our conversations uh, concerning the anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So stick around.
There we are. Our, our little camera just needs are loading in. There we go. Everybody. Yeah, there we are. We're back. <laughs> yeah. We are back. Well, thank you for everyone for sticking through this um, very multifaceted evening with us. <laughs> and we are just moving on to the next facet of this 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 evening. Um, Derek, did you did you want to take us home here? <laughs> I can. Uh, I. I, I I can in just a second here, actually, if you want to lead the way. I yeah, you got it. Okay. I see that All our right. guests, are, their names, even though I um, I pushed them over their blanks. So I'm trying to fix that while so everybody. Uh... No problem. These are two individuals I'm so familiar with, so I'm happy to. Um, so in our conversation today, that's really revolving around um, us falling between the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, Hiroshima would have been on August 6th and Nagasaki on the 9th, just to make that clarification. So we're right in the middle. Um, here on the 8th. Um, but uh, moving on in the conversation about this, um, where are we now? Why are we talking about this? What does 75 years later look like? Where does it intersect with art? We have all these questions and we have two new guests that are helping us unpack some of these things. So um, without further ado, we have um, Matt Field from the uh, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And I always wanna say journal, it's Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. Um, and I don't even feel like I can do a brief introduction of uh, the bulletin because there's just so much to say, so we'll table it. But Matt is also um, a former um, NHK uh, correspondent, if you are all familiar with NHK, um, and has agreed to chat with us about um, all of his work and what he's doing um, with the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists and um, give us a little more information about some of these contemporary issues about um, atomic bombs and um, I guess uh, where where we stand on a in a on a worry level, I suppose. <laughs> and then also we have Yuki Miyamoto. And uh for me she's always Miyamoto sensei and Tai as well. She's um if you know me well I just refer to her as patron Saint Yuki because she is just someone who's so dear to me. Um in my background I actually spent a lot of time in Hiroshima um with the guidance of Yuki um working uh at the Peace Institute and the um Peace Park and Museum. So um, Yuki teaches at DePaul University. Um, she takes students to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki every other year, I believe, on a trip to um, unpack some of these issues personally um, and um, teaches on um, in the religious studies department, um, kind of focused on ethics. But I won't uh, jump too much more into your own personal backgrounds if you'd both like to introduce yourselves. Please go ahead, Yuki. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanna, I, I just wanna show this to people. This is um, when I first met Michael, the artist in the first segment. He gave this to me, and this was something um, his mother had made, and I am treasuring this, and because I know that how valuable this is to him. Um, I'm also treasuring my mom's, um, what she made while she was alive. And so I just wanted to show that this is the connection between the two sections. And also um, my mother was also Hibakusha, uh, a mile away from the from the hypo center at the age of six. And it's very interesting to hear about Salako's story because um, my mom also went to the same junior high school four years apart. So they, they were not in the same school at the same time, um, but the same junior high. Um, unfortunately, because of the uh, radiation and sickness, she was, she was not well uh, in the 30s, 40s. She needed to get some blood booster sort of thing every other week, which I didn't know. Another connection to Michael's story, there is always a secret in the family. Um, I've never, um, she never told me about her story, but I somehow knew, uh, which was also a strange thing, I somehow knew and I didn't want to ask her because you, you don't want to see your parents' vulnerability. Uh, so I have been avoiding and it's now too late. She passed away in 2001. Um, so I'm, I'm now regretting. I should have, I should have asked a lot of questions. Um, but that, that's my uh, background or maybe the source of obsession. Uh, so that's how I, um, I've been teaching and I've been doing this. But one more thing, if I, if I can add, um, I'm also 
a little bit frustrated um, being surrounded just one story in Hiroshima, you know, and that's a story that needs to be hard. But at the same time, I just realized I don't know other stories. In other words, if 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 the uh, nuclear weapons are, ha are still here, it means that our plea is not hard. So there must be some reasons. And I started thinking that maybe I should know more about how this has been understood in the United States. And what happened was I also found many hibaksha in the United States from the uranium mining and the nuclear tests, which, you know, 1,032 times. And so I'm hoping that um, right now, actually, with my great friend and colleague, Dr. Norma Field, what we have been doing is trying to bring um, Hibakusha from Japan, either Hiroshima or Nagasaki, and meet those, and then also um, have Hibakusha meet from both countries. And then maybe they can have bonding or, or uh, share the same identity as Hibakusha and some kind of um, collaboration. That, that's something I would like to do now. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are wonderful. And I heard my voice echo. <laughs> was that was it a temporary anomaly? I think so. But yeah, thank you so much, Yuki. Um, I, I can't say enough about all the things that Yuki has done for this field and um, really bringing education to everyone on this and, you know, at the crux of the importance. I don't want to gush too much because I can't stop. So I'm going to move over to um, Matt, who... Um, uh, just really comes from this local organization. And I think this is something that we could even begin to talk about out the gates if you want to introduce yourself, but um, the journal or see the bulletin of the atomic scientists that um, um, actually exists here in Chicago um, out of University of Chicago. So a lot of these nuclear issues um, have, a, have a really strong background in history right here in Chicago where Tokyo House Party is filmed. So um, it feels ever more relevant and um, there's a lot of things to be said that are, are right in our back door here. So that being said, Matt, if you'd like to introduce yourself to everyone so we can know you a little more. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad to be at the Tokyo house party. It's a pretty cool uh, event you all are putting on. And so I'm a, I uh, am an editor at the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. I mainly cover um what we call disruptive technologies like artificial intelligence and uh you know and it's sort of like an umbrella term and I, I do a lot of stuff related to biosecurity as well and lately we've been doing a lot of coverage on the pandemic mm -hmm. so i'm not you know i was telling to my colleagues at the bulletin the other day that there are probably four or five of them that could have a more rich discussion about nuclear weapons than i could but you know given that uh, Yuki so kindly asked me to come on because of a personal connection we have. She's, uh, as you mentioned, she's a collaborator. I'm, word sounds kind of funny, but you know, in the good sense with my uh, mother, <laughs> Norma Field. Uh, and uh, so, and, you know, and so I guess that uh, unfortunately the Tokyo house party crew will have to put up with a Bargain basement uh, <laughs> comics oh, uh, by no means nuclear <laughs> weapons person. <laughs> oh, that's, we, we're so, here to hear all the things, and especially to learn because I, I think what's interesting that you can even add to is, um, well, you can if you let us know how the um, bulletin started, but where it is now, it, it really touches on so many things outside of nuclear issues and what adds yeah. to this topic that will approach the doomsday clock. Oh yes, for sure. You know it's. Uh, uh, it started by it was started by the <clears throat> scientists who had worked on the Manhattan Project to develop the atomic bomb, and um, you know, really before things were, in, you know, short, right around the time that they were making the first test of the uh, atomic bomb, you know, in the month or so before uh, they actually dropped the U.S. dropped them two of them on on Japan. The, these scientists already had a lot of questions and concerns about what they were developing. And that just only escalated after um, they saw uh, the destruction that these, these devices had caused. Um, and so a few of them, uh, mainly, I, I think most of the initial crew were based at the University of Chicago where they were scientists. 
they started the bulletin to try to raise the the, uh, the you know the, the the public's awareness of the nuclear age, the atomic age, as they called it, uh, in that in that era. And they were pretty strongly concerned. Um, it started out as just a little newsletter, or and I shouldn't say little, but it started out as a newsletter, and then about well, I think a, two two years later, it became a year and a half later, it became a, a full fledged magazine. And and so in 1947, there's that cover with the uh, um, that showed showed the this iconic image of the doomsday clock and that's sort of been a key feature of the bulletin ever since but um yeah i mean if i i it's uh ever, since then the issues that the bulletin is focused while largely um while nuclear weapons are still a huge part of the focus um we've branched out and now climate change and uh and also, you know, the, the the risks of new technologies that are becoming more and more important in our lives, like, uh, you know, artificial intelligence, including, you know, face recognition, which is so problematic, um, you know, are becoming more part of, you know, the, the issues that we that we are covering. So, you know, that's that's what I'm doing now. I you you I, I previously I worked as a, a producer for NHK, not a oh, okay, uh, <laughs> not Thank a court. Fine. Producer is the person that uh, gets no glory. It's behind the scenes. <laughs> We're getting it now. We're here for it. <laughs> shout out! Shout out to producers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was a, it's a great uh, experience. I covered the presidential elections in 2012 and 2016 with with NHK and spent time in Iowa and uh, all all the swing states. And you know, it's just amazed that just people just standing in line outside of a campaign event then allow us just to go into their homes and take up a day of their time like you know getting to know them and mm -hmm. filming every moment of it so you know it was an interesting experience as well and it was interesting to try to to see what how the you know to, to get a sense of like how other countries in this, in this case japan were perceiving u.s politics and yeah. yeah. Uh, what issue, you know, kind of get a different perspective on that. Yeah. Ma yeah. Matt, I, I, I wanted to ask real quick, uh, not only for myself and for viewers at home, but do you mind uh, expanding a little bit when you say, uh, I, I understand the context, but uh, when you say disruptive technology and, and biosecurity for those who might not be familiar with those terms? Yeah, sure. So disruptive technology is, uh, it's sort of a catch all term to cover the, like, uh, I guess as as a journalist, I have a beat, and at the bulletin, my beat is mm -hmm. you know uh, I, I I cover issues related to AI. I also cover you know lab safety or mm -hmm. you know, bio weapons, um, and lately I've been covering uh, a variety of things related to the pandemic. So uh, we call that disruptive technology, and that's course kind of like a, a checkbox on our uh, our. Uh, uh, website. <laughs> it's kind of like a drop down on our website so yeah. that people can see. It's it's a uh, so it's not um, exactly the most easy to define term I would say, but you know it's, it it shows you. It, I guess it's a good indication that we're not uh, that we have expanded our the focus of the things we take into account and the, the, our area of coverage at the bulletin. And it's something mm -hmm. that the the folks behind the doomsday clock, the the setting every year that they consider you know, at um, events in, in, in these fields um, as well as nuclear and climate change too. Yeah, you know, I wonder, I think this is kind of like a cool place to start this intersection of um, art and activism is the clock itself. Because as you had mentioned, you know, before um, that that issue of the, the bulletin came out with the clock on it, someone created this clock as a representative or some kind of, um, articulation for the fear that they were feeling or the um the the threat that was um hard hard to explain and so in an image how can that be done and so this clock became ubiquitous with all of this fear and all of this uncertainty um and i'm so curious if there's um things known about whoever created the clock and i wonder if you and yuki could maybe chime in a bit about um what is this clock about? How is it calculated? Um, where was it? Where is it? All of those things. Yeah, for sure. I actually uh, sent a couple of 
images that might be yeah. illustrative. Uh, Derek, if you could pull up number one. Can do. <laughs> I have to say candidly too, whenever I thought about meeting someone from the bulletin, I was thinking it could be like someone in like where metal music would just follow them in and they would just be like a big dark. I'll give me just a sec here to make sure that everybody's uh, microphones are in the scene uh, so that our viewers at home can hear you uh, talk about the images that you provided. Uh, see, I have Matt, I have Yuki and I have Sarah's. Let me make sure that that's pushed over. Great. So yeah, I, with this first image here, tell us what we are, are looking at, Matt. Oh yeah, for sure. Let me pull it up as well so I can see. Um, so, you know, you say, you kind of like, uh, Sarah kind of conjured up the image of this religious sect or something, and <laughs> that's quite funny too. Uh, you know, these are just a few examples of uh, people's theories on how the doomsday clock is uh, set. I found these on Twitter. So Chris at Christos, nine, at Christos 970 said, according to my math, the earth has been around for 5 billion years. So if the doomsday clock is 100 seconds from midnight, does that mean we have approximately 66 days left? And then I won't finish his tweet. It goes into this calculation, and I'm not sure if it's internally <laughs> valid or not. But it it gives you the sense that uh, at Christos 970 thinks there's sort of like a, a mathematical or algorithm behind uh, the doomsday <laughs> clock that you know suck, pulling in all this data from around the world. Um, and likewise, uh, Rob Kaiser says uh, you know the uh, the models need to be looked at a bit like the nuclear doomsday clock prediction algorithm. Um, another person is calling us out, Bone Spirit Raider. <laughs> Show us the map behind these random doomsday clock settings, please. <laughs> so uh, these, uh, well, uh, interesting. That's not exactly how things are done. Um, at the bulletin, uh, right. <laughs> it's not at all how things are done. In case anybody, one of my colleagues, is watching, I don't want to get in trouble for. <laughs> but, uh, so, for uh, initially, um, a person, a Manhattan uh, Project phys uh, scientist, Eugene Rabinowitz, who was a longtime editor for the bulletin. I don't think he was the first editor, but you know, in the he he was fairly early on. Um, he, uh, you know, he was uh, fluent in Russian and he had contacts in the scientific and policy community around the world and talked all the time. And uh, he uh, he said that he decided where the doomsday clock should be set. So after, you know, it was first the cover of the magazine indicated that it was, we were seven minutes to midnight. Uh, Eugene Rabinowitz had authority over the subsequent, I don't know how many years to kind of move it around. And um and that's that's what he did. Um, and uh, speaking of that uh, cover, so it started at seven. And can I just ask the the question that I I would love to know the answer to? What yeah. happens at midnight exactly? Like, what is midnight then? <laughs> you know, like what is? <laughs> I, I don't I don't know that I've ever heard anybody <clears throat> explain exactly. I mean, I think uh, you know the end of the you know uh, the the. Uh, a very diminished civilization, I think, is where we, what will happen at, at midnight. So, uh, Derek, if you could pull up, um, I, I forgot to show people this first cover. It's number four. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Oh, no. It seems like it could have so many interpretations. So <laughs> Certainly, certainly. And, and Matt, no apologies needed. I'm here to facilitate the images. So yeah. let me know as you need them. So these are, that's the first cover that's uh, on over there, the, the, or, uh, the, the one that's a magazine cover. Okay. That was designed by uh, Mart Martel Langsdorf. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. She uh, was an artist uh, and, uh, you know, she was married to one of the Manhattan Project scientists. And I think the story is that she just decided that, uh, well, initially she was thinking of going with, um, the symbol for uranium for the first cover. This was the first magazine cover, the first magazine of the bulletin in 1947. But uh, you know, she had, she, these scientists were all very concerned about nuclear power and nuclear weapons. And uh, 
you know, she, she heard their anxiety and uh, she thought that clock would actually be the best metaphor because they were worried about the, what was going to happen next in this the chain of events that they had that they had helped unleash. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she, she set up, she developed the idea of a clock and then the seven minutes, as far as I understand it, is just purely aesthetic. Oh, okay. No rhyme or reason. Wow. <laughs> and then she thought that that looked good and that kind of like, you know, gave the... Uh, bulletin about a 15 minute window to kind of work in uh, from that point on. Um, so I guess this is a good as a good good point as any. Uh, so uh, if you could go to number two, Derek, yeah. would be great. Certainly. And while I'm getting that up, I, I want to draw attention because I, I think it's important for uh, even if our viewers at home know, uh, but this clock is a metaphor. You cannot buy it in the Apple Store or Swatch or Rolex. Um, and so uh, making that clear to the to the viewers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So no, no, you, you did your part. I just I, I want to. <laughs> <You're that>. <laughs> yeah, because it, it's there have been so many uh, moments in media and, and pop culture where the clock has been represented in, in some sort of physicality as as a tool for the meta metaphor, but not uh, attaching the part that like, oh, yeah, there's no actual physical clock, you know, uh, Watchmen, it being a, a recent example of how uh, they showed them moving the dial on the clock. And so, yeah, yeah. Uh, but sorry, please yeah. continue. Oh, yeah, no, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I have not seen all of the uh, artwork that and, and the, the, kind of the comics and everything that's been based on the clock, but there is quite a lot out there. Mm -hmm. So this is a quote by uh, the CEO of the Bulletin, Rachel Bronson. And I think she put, um, I'm not just saying this because, you know, she, she signs my checks, but I think she, <laughs> she put the, uh, she kind of described what the clock is really well. And she said, the issues that we are measuring are so complicated and they're so technical and they're so big that often they are daunting. These are big issues. People know they're important but they don't know how they talk about it, let alone what to do about it. What the clock does is it lets people talk about it. Mm. And so if you can pull up number three, Derek. Yeah, I love that. There you, go. you can see that this is the some of the coverage we got after the most recent clock announcement. This is... These are, uh, you know, mainstream outlets and there was so much activity on social media as well. Uh, these are, uh, this is sort of indicative of how just by coming out and saying, here's where the clock is this year, it gives people the opportunity to the media and others to dive into some of the issues that they otherwise wouldn't, uh, mm -hmm. nuclear weapons, you know, are not really all that covered by the New York times or CNN or any, really any, uh, so many other outlets. Uh, so the clock announcement is like you know, it's sort of, uh, it's, it's not a, based on an algorithm or anything. It's, mm -hmm. but it get it's, a, it's an event that, you know, it uses this metaphor of the clock to, to tell people to pay attention to this, what's going on in these fields, particularly nuclear weapons and to, to focus on it for a second. And, and, and that's what I think, uh, it accomplishes. Um, uh, so in that sense, you know, it's a, it's a very, uh, powerful, uh, symbol. Yeah. And um, I wonder, could you tell us how we got to what, because we're right now, we, we started at seven minutes and now we're at 100 seconds. So right now in 2020. Yeah. What? No, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a great question. And uh, it's fluctuated over the years. And for a long time, that had mainly to do with what was going on with nuclear weapons, the tensions between, you know, the Soviet Union and uh, uh, the United States. Um, so if you go to uh, slide five, Derek. That, yep. You know, this is, <laughs> um, so this is uh, the 1953 clock statement, and this is Eugene Rabinovich, the, the guy who was basically setting it uh, based on where he thought things were. Uh, I think that, uh, he said, it's embarrassing. I can't remember what the exact setting was that year. Um, I want to say two minutes. So he he was very concerned in 1953 about what was going on, and he says, "The hands of the clock of doom have moved again. Only a few more swings of the pendulum, 
and from Moscow to Chicago, atomic explosions will strike midnight for Western civilization. So this was after the U.S. and, and uh, the Soviet Union developed hydrogen weapons, so a, a much more powerful weapon than the, the bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima. It's also something these Manhattan Project scientists predicted that, you know, the, it wasn't just the U.S. that was going to have these things. It was other countries and first and foremost, the Soviet Union, and that, you know, an arms race dynamic would take, take hold. And so that's exactly uh, how things started to unfold pretty rapidly. Um, and uh, I wish that we still called it the clock of doom and not the doomsday clock. I kind of like that. <laughs> it's pretty heavy, I got to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think he, he was a very, uh, he had a way with, he was a wordsmith. Um, mm -hmm. And so then in, uh, if you could go to clocks or slide six, and you know, it's it's in that wordsmithing that um, I, I have one other question I'm, I'm holding on to uh, that that will circle back in a, in a moment here. Yeah. Um, in the meantime, I can give you um, some little uh, anecdote or, or just a little episode that Sarah might like. Uh, in 1953, December was the t uh, was the uh, was the month that uh, President Eisenhower made a Adams for speech. Uh, with, uh, Adams for, uh, Adams for Peace speech, uh, which is, you know, saying that um, the power of Adam is not just destructive, but we can use it mm. for peace and then creating the um, mm. uh, nuclear power plants. But three months later, uh, this is the important part, uh, three months later, there was a bikini I, uh, Marshall Islands, there were some tests going on in the bikini at all. There was a big um, uh, blah blah went off and that's how uh that's the beginning of the godzilla oh so, that's oh, so wow. important for us yeah. And so yeah, that's the, the, um yeah that's the kuryu maru lucky dragon number five that's the march first in 1954 three months after 1953's adam spoke speech that's amazing. And I think, you know, it's worth noting that we had also planned to have a Godzilla expert come tonight too and, and talk about Godzilla, but there's just too many things happening. <laughs> but we hope to invite everyone back for like a Godzilla kind of marathon and um, talk about how this really important cultural icon was born from um, this history. And I think it's something that's a little overlooked and um, it's so important. So thank mm -hmm. you so much, Yuki. And you can, do you have any other insights on these timelines? Because this is like, I feel like this history is the back of your hand. So if you have any other insights as we're moving along, please, we're, that's lovely. Sure, I, I chime in. And if I'm going too long, just cut me off. No. <laughs> we are here to listen. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's it's uh, the Atoms for Peace uh, they, they were uh, consideration. The people were trying to figure out all kinds of uses for uh, not just nuclear energy, but for the weapons themselves. I believe there were uh, ideas for like using them to build canals and things like that, like explode instead of you know excavation and dynamite, just you know nuke. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> some place mm -hmm. where you want a canal. Yeah. Uh, so. Um, <clears throat> This, uh, this is 1988, so this is an example of it going uh, back. Um, the time went to uh, six minutes. So it had gone forward all the way to two minutes, and it went back to six minutes. And this was because uh, um, the uh, Soviet Union and the United States signed uh, a, an important arms control agreement. And so... A lot of activists want to see um, nuclear weapons abolished and, you know, removed. Um, and then there's a whole other group of pragmatists, as you, if you want to call them that. Um, and they are uh, strongly uh, big proponents of these these arms control agreements. And this one that was signed, I think it was 1987, uh, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Agreement, just it... Um, <clears throat> eliminated a whole category of nuclear weapons that the U.S. and the Soviet Union had built up. And I forget the exact number, uh, but it uh, it made sure it a uh, whole hundreds, if not more, uh, nuclear or missiles that could carry nuclear warheads were eliminated. I think it, I think it was something like 2000 something on yeah. both sides. So, you know, for a long time, these weapons, just the numbers of warheads and delivery systems, et cetera, et cetera, just kept going up and up. And 
uh, you know, to astronomical levels. I think it was like the U.S. at one point had 30 something nuclear warheads on it in 30,000 uh, in its possession. And so arms control agreements like the uh, intermediate range nuclear forces agreement helped bring the, start to bring those numbers down, which is mm -hmm. a key mm -hmm. step uh, towards getting rid of them all, uh, all together. Hopefully. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so then, uh, I know I'm going on a, a long time here. No, <laughs> so no, <then> so <laughs> much has happened. It's tough. We're talking about 75 years right now. So yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, if you bear with me for just another tidbit here. Okay. So then in 1991, if you could go to slide seven, yep. uh, Derek. Inbound. There we go. So the uh, this was seven. The clock moved back seventeen to seventeen minutes to midnight. So I'm not exactly sure what it looked like, unfortunately, because we only have that fifteen minutes of space to work with on the design. Oh, <laughs> I should have looked into that. Anyway, people were very excited at the bulletin that uh, the Cold War had ended and that mm -hmm. you know this big this arms control agreement had been signed earlier. It, things were definitely hopeful. Uh, and uh, you know, in this little statement, this this segment of the the, uh, the doomsday clock statement says, uh, in the context of a disintegrating Soviet Union, large nuclear arsenals are even more clearly seen as a liability, a yardstick of insecurity. So you know, there was a great hope that uh, the, the 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 age of nuclear weapons was uh, at least going to become or at least on its way out the door mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and of course that hope did not last long and especially in recent years it's been uh uh pretty uh pretty hard uh the inf agreement that was so important that that eliminated this character this huge category of weapons uh the u.s pulled out of that blaming russia for violating it and russia blamed the u.s for violating it and now there's no uh there's no treaty to prevent these two countries from once again developing these, uh, replacing the weapons they had, they had gotten rid of. Um, and one of the last big arms control agreements uh, that um, uh, it's called a New Start. Uh, it uh, it does it. The U.S. has it's still in effect, um, but the U.S. is uh, threatening to or it's you know that that you, you, you Trump, the Trump administration won't just renew it. They're saying we need to bring China into uh, into this agreement that uh, primarily concerns the uh, uh, so, uh, Russia and the U.S. because those two countries hold ninety have ninety percent of the nuclear weapons in the world. So. Um, I wonder you know, if I could ask you too, as you talk about that, because I'm so curious. Like, so we're, jumping forward to now with 100 seconds is that time influenced by and, and i'm just going to speak to the uh elephant in the room in every room sorry um is it is it due to our current um leadership is that does that also kind of influence how the time is decided understanding like presidents and leaders willingness to use weapons and not just who has what but like the stability of our political climate i guess Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, certainly the stability of the political climate plays a big part in it. And mm -hmm. uh, the bulletin's nonpartisan, but uh, ah, you know, okay. the administration okay. is pulling up, pulling the plug on an important arms control agreement that helped make things a little bit better in, in the context of nuclear weapons. Then, uh, you know, you can't say that the fact that uh, the president is Trump has no bearing on where the Mm -hmm. <laughs> where things are heading because ultimately it's his decision on on how to treat these these important uh, agreements yeah i think no, it's so important too because it helped us understand like why right now what's happening now that that's it's still a topic that's that's being toyed with at levels that we can't control and um the doomsday clock reflects that as well um right. yeah and yuki do, do you have something yeah for sure. And and also, I think a month ago or so, President Trump made an announcement that uh, they are ready to resume the nuclear tests. And actually, a committee in the Senate, Senate they passed a bill which, um, which says uh, 
10 million dollars to prepare for the nuclear tests in the midst of this corona you know covid 19 chaos oh. um i yeah so i think um if this bill um if this bill is passed then it could be used this 10 million could go to the tests or preparation mm -hmm. for the tests mm -hmm. and I, I think that is also uh, included in calculate calculating that's well, so I think important. you bring up a good point uh yuki because the, the the these weapons are extraordinarily expensive and the u.s is undertaking a big modernization program of its arsenal that's going to cost something like 1.7 trillion dollars over 30 years. So, mm -hmm. a lot of money is gone is put into maintaining nuclear weapons in the mm -hmm. U.S. and other countries. It's not just the U.S. That's right, right. All, all nuclear countries. Big right. money, and we could obviously do better. Have, spend this money in better ways. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I wanted to ask uh, from from both of your standpoints. Uh, you know, one of the things that stuck with me from. Uh, the things that you touched on, Matt, earlier, and and sort of my own thoughts about um, the, the the politics of this, the the doomsday clock, and our, our my relationship as uh, with it as living in this country. Um, how has the perspective of uh, of nuclear uh, what's the other half of that word or that phrase? Um, but uh, how, how's how's the perspective of, of nuclear things stuff <laughs> uh shifted for individuals um in in different countries and, and over the years because i am asking this because it, it seems as though for at least myself and maybe others uh that it, within this country it has kind of uh been desensitized in the way that it it has made its way into comics as a form of entertainment and i don't think that that ever actually conveys the the true magnitude of the doomsday clock and i don't think that um and again coming from my own uh, opinion i don't think that the weight of what the doomsday clock represents is reaching audiences as it should or, or say wider audiences as it should because of you know this sort of commercialized and um entertainment version of what that means you know now it's it when we talk about it and even when we read articles i i can't i can't help but hear it in a, almost a daily bugle superman uh reporter kind of voice you know because of that's how it's been uh, shown in so many different forms of media so uh, again to reiterate yeah how is our perspective of of uh nuclear warfare nuclear warfare and, and the politics that surround it changed over the years and and uh yuki um if you could also speak from uh, your perspective on that as well yeah, can I can I go ahead? Um, because yeah. I'm so, I'm so glad that um, you mentioned the comic book and stuff. Because uh, first of all, I wanted to add a little bit about this lucky dragon number five because um, the bomb which was detonated as a test um, at the Bikini Atoll in 1954, it was too big, so it was um, um, actually Japanese tuna shipping uh, ship tuna. Uh, ship uh, got caught. Uh, they got caught um, the nuclear fallout, and um, they turn, turned around. They went back to Japan, but um, the radio communicator passed away six months after. Uh, so that really shook Japan, and that led to Godzilla. <laughs> Sorry, so I I kind of skipped that part. Um, mm. But again, so this is the connection between the nuclear and its imagination, our imagination, which is Godzilla or even yeah. Spider-Man. Um, you know, many, many of those um, Marvel heroes, Marvel yes. comic heroes, they were empowered by expo exposure to radiation. And that's yeah. sort of our imagination, right? And um, I remember vividly um, after Fukushima accident, the... Um, they show the um, Colbert. Uh, Colbert was talking about they found radioactive material uh, radiation detected in the in a in, in a bottle of wine in California or something like that. And then they were uh, they were speculating that radiation came from the Fukushima accident. Um, but of course, that's a you know that's a 
funny show. So they were making a joke. So if you drink this wine, you would be so empowered and, <laughs> you know, like uh, kill everyone kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's the popular. I'm not saying it, this is just the U.S. I guess in Japan in a different way. Um, I don't know uh, where I, if you know Doraemon. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Doraemon is actually um, operated by nuclear nuclear power, so it's it, it's really speaking yeah. into subculture, popular culture, and sort of um, very familiar in a way, but very unfamiliar. You know, that part is never being um, emphasized. So this is a little bit off of topic from the Doomsday Clock, but I just. I no, just, I was so excited to hear that. Yeah, that no, happened. this is yeah. right on topic because these are all the ways that art kind of expresses. Mm -hmm. These are all arts that express this topic right. and yeah. people responding to it in these ways that can educate or confuse people. <laughs> it yeah. can go a few ways. Yeah, no, yeah. Derek, that was that's so, so insightful because I, I actually yeah. don't read a lot of comics to know that the Doomsday Clock is so prevalent in comics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is very much the entertainment is very much the space that I come from as um, being a game designer and uh, reading comics and, and all of those types of things. Spider-Man is my favorite Marvel character. Uh, and now Miles, you know, we'll talk about that another time. But, um, you know, it it has always been prevalent to me. And, and even, uh, you know, recognizing Godzilla and Godzilla being a, a reactionary story to Japan's relationship to uh, nuclear fallout. And so, um, yeah, it, it's, I'm curious of uh, the, both the positive and negative sides of, of viewing our relationship to nuclear uh, uh, politics in this way. And if uh, most importantly, uh, especially with the doomsday clock to circle back, um, Matt, how do you think we can begin to, begin to put this information in front of viewers in a way that educates them in a more precise way so that they might be able to separate themselves from say some of the cinematography that comes with it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, uh, it's an interesting, interesting question. Uh, you're, you're asking how, how do you uh, get people to, I guess, to, to be concerned about the issue of nuclear yeah. war? Yeah. Consider, I mean, I think it's it's uh, really challenging. I mean, there was just a, a poll out that where you know uh, some almost a plurality of uh, Americans said that the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were were good were good, uh, and wow. you know a little few a few percentage points less people. They, these were both numbers in the 30s said it was the wrong decision, and mm -hmm. you know, 40 some percent of Americans said. Uh, no, the U.S. shouldn't apologize for anything. And I think <clears throat> they've developed, I mean, I think these, this, that line of thinking is uh, born of, uh, you know, just limited just information in school and elsewhere about, about nuclear war or war in general. And, yeah. you know, you read in the history books, uh, you know, the U.S. had to, was either going to invade Japan and incur, you know, innumerable losses or it was going to, or it, it could use these atomic weapons and, and it used the weapons. And then two days later, you know, a few days later, Japan surrendered. But, uh, right. you know, that's an incomplete story. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, Actually, and I think I, that's like so important because what I hope we can do here today and kind of keep talking about it is um, understanding um, history from a single source, just mm -hmm. one textbook you had from your high school or one plaque you read somewhere or, you just, everything has a perspective, good or bad, and everything is written by someone with, with their own agenda. Um, so having a few different things to compare and contrast to find out what's true for you is so crucial, especially right now for all of us um, in this world where we have just a constant influx of information. Yeah. Um, and I feel like what's really lovely, Derek, that you asked that question is that I feel that the journal, or the, see, I do it every time, the Bulletin of the Atomic <laughs> Scientists um, have kind of put some thought into this. And why I'm so excited to talk to Matt and kind of be connected to them today is that there really is this very strong connection between museums being a place um, that explore uh, social justice and political issues and yeah. um, the intersection between art and um, activism. So um, the I'll let Matt explain it a little bit more. And Yuki, if you have some insights too, um, 
And Derek, if you can help us get there, um, the Museum of Science and Industry here in Chicago actually collaborated with the um, Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists to um, create an exhibition about the doomsday clock and a timeline and kind of all of these different kinds of information from mm -hmm. historical documents to um, some of the entertainment things we're probably familiar with all in one spot. And the, as, as I found out today, the exhibition is actually closed, but it's all virtual now and you can all visit it from wherever you are and continue to learn to no end. So I will turn it over to whoever can explain this for everyone. Oh, wow. Oh, guys, it seems that they can't hear anything. Oh, they can't really. Um, oh, uh, let's see. Oh, I, I see what happened. Uh, let me fix. It was a, one of the audio sources got. Sorry. Um, <laughs> When the audio sources got a little fumbled there. Uh, we sh let's make sure. Thank you all for letting us know when these things happen. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the heads up. Yeah, so we should be good now. I'm um, sorry if there's anything that you wanted to uh, revisit for our viewers uh, uh, because they, they didn't hear your explanation there. Okay, so it, it, this exhibit, you can visit it and virtually navigate through it and see, learn a lot about the history of uh, nuclear weapons. and. Uh, so if you go to the panel on the Manhattan Project, yeah. Uh, if you can, you go forward a little. Is, is that possible? Like yeah, move. this works a bit like Google Maps. If you all come to navigate this, and oh. you should, but it's yeah. like Google Maps. You can advance. Yeah. So I guess you can. So there, there's a little video. I don't know if we have time to play it. It's. Uh, well, but sure. it gives you, I, the only reason I pointed out because everything in in this archive is very interesting. But in this video. Yeah one of the people involved in the Manhattan Project talks about, you know, what it was like after learning about Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, you know, kind of, and it, it kind of nicely uh, sums up how these people were pretty conflicted. Certainly. <laughs> part of the reason why the bulletin was born. Let me uh, just give a double check here to make sure that our, our and, you know, it's, is providing it's, audio. It's okay if people just want to explore on their own too. I just, um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, I think it, just with regard to time, I will. One yeah, of the things that I, I do want to make sure I will. I'll get the. Uh, I have the links at the ready. Um, once I'm done facilitating the screen share here, and I can make sure to drop those into chat. So viewers at home, you can tour this environment at your own pace and and take a stop at all of these different uh, terminals to to see the different uh, the various information that's here. And presented because there's a lot i would stay here all day if i had the opportunity yeah and it's so great that though the exhibition isn't on view any longer you can really explore this indefinitely and there's so much information here and this is i think what's so lovely about the future of the way people are thinking now and how information and education can be um, shared and experienced and engaged with and this exhibition that's online still allows you to do your own level of engagement as well and touch things mm -hmm. and take closer looks and it's, it's really lovely. So um, if this is a history you would like to, um, and not even a history, but a current event that you'd like to know more about, um, it's all right here, very thoughtfully um, organized for you. So yeah, all online from the safety of your home. Yes, yes. Matt, are there any other pieces in this environment that you wanted to call attention to while we were here? Oh, I, I think people can get a good sense uh, of exploring on their own. Cool, cool. Yeah. So I wonder if we, since we have, you know, maybe 10 more minutes left or so, Yuki and um, Matt, I wonder, since we're kind of talking about what we're doing now and how we can think about these things now, 
I would love to pose the same question to both of you that we posed to Michael in terms of how do you all feel about things now? And in this moment, what do you think is a way to move forward? Or um, in this moment, what thoughts are you having? Um, yes, actually, um, you know, this is the 75th commemoration, uh, Hiroshima August 6th and Nagasaki August 9th. So I, I've, um, I've given a couple of opportunities to appear at Zoom conferences and, and Zoom programs. And one of the questions that I got from the audience was um, why this is, wh why this is not considered as a genocide? And um, or why why this is not much known, and partly uh, and one of the reasons is that I think somehow things are so compartmentalized. Uh, the youth were, um, you know, young people are very active, especially in the United States, and that is something I'm really looking forward to. And I, I have lots of respect for those youth, young people. Um, but some are very active and in the um, environmental issues, and others are consider uh, others are more into racial issues. We all know that they are all connected, mm -hmm. uh, but somehow um, on on the surface level, it is compartmentalized. But as, as I said earlier, lots of money is going to the decontamination of the former nuclear weapon factories or facilities, or a lot of money goes to this preparation for resuming nuclear weapons. Um, so um, it's, and, and also the nuclear test sites, those downwinders, they tend to be racial minorities. You know, those people who are in reserved areas, uh, territory. Uh, so it's definitely an uh, environmental justice issue. So um, I'm hoping that we can sort of bring that together and this nuclear issue is not necessarily a political issue, which means like someone who, is, someone who are up high in politics, they decide, they dictate, um, but rather there is something we can do in the same way that environmental justice, racial justice, we are so active. Um, so I'm hoping that that kind of awareness would be more um, widely shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think, and, and Yuki, just, just even here, I feel like we could do a part two of this. I say this in every show because I just want to keep the conversations going. But Always. Um, there is a, I just want to share anecdotally, I think in my time with Yuki over the years, I attended a, a University of Chicago conference and there was a boy there who was far younger than I am who is from uh, New Mexico. And he was a graffiti artist and a comic book artist, but all of his family had passed away from cancer because um, his reservation was located on a um, uranium mining facility, I believe. And he was so compelling. And there's just so many people out there doing really difficult things with what they have and um, sharing it through art that I, I, I still try to keep in touch with him because his, his um, He's a, just such a wonderful public speaker and, and he was so moving, but there's, there's so many things to say on this topic um, that feels so old at 75 years, but it isn't at all. And I'm just floored by all the things we could talk about right now, but yeah, I wish we had more time. <laughs> Absolutely. Matt, what are your thoughts? Um, well, I think that, uh, you know, it's very difficult now to um, think about almost anything other than you know the pandemic and coronavirus and getting past that. And you know, it's it's it, there are these other very important issues, and I'm sure once again we'll be able to focus on them as well: climate change and uh, um, the, the nuclear weapons. And I think that uh, you know, in terms of people's awareness of where things are with nuclear weapons. I think it's, it's, it's just shocking to realize um, how many there are of these things around the world. And, you know, the fact there are like, um, so the US and Russia together, they have uh, close to 15,000, but over 12, or close to 13,000 nuclear weapons. And, you know, France, UK, China, Pakistan, India, they have hundreds 
of uh, nuclear additional weapons in Israel and North Korea, they have them. Uh, so, you know, it's an issue and we don't have arms, we're losing our arms control agreements that are bringing those down. I think that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a scary thing because you worry about are these countries, is the U.S. going to just try to increase, do whatever Russia is doing and are we going to get into another arms strike race or other countries right. going to join in, join in and that sort of thing. And, I think also the fact that, uh, you know, the thing that was helping with nuclear weapons to bring them down international diplomacies <clears throat> is something that's being affected or is, is, uh, is also a, a process that's being much maligned during the pandemic with the administration threatening to pull out of the WHO. And uh, yeah. it's also obviously, uh, you know, we're the, the the U.S. has pulled out of the climate agreement. And so there's just a, um, I think in, in some, the, the, the way these are, these big problems are being approached, nuclear weapons, climate, health, they're all, it's all uh, kind of in a nationalistic approach by in, on the part of the United States and, and other countries as well, I'm sure, in some cases. And it's not, uh, it's not the best way forward. And it kind of, it's deeply concerning. Yeah. 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 I, I feel like, obligated, but also understanding that things can't always end um, feeling good. But I do want to say that it's through all of the things that we're all doing, even sitting here right now. And anyone who is here with us right now, you're doing the thing too, you know? Yes. Um, and us, I feel like this is a, this is me just speaking from my personal viewpoints, that this is such a moment in time that we're all sharing together where people are starting to um, find their voices and um, be more active and feeling empowered to do that. And I just am so for it. And I hope that we can all continue to have these meaningful conversations and um, talk together and, and find ways of, of letting everyone know what's happening in our worlds. And to that end, I hope that um, we get to see everyone on this show again and have more conversations. And um, if you are a DePaul student by any chance and you don't take a class with Miyamoto Sensei, you are just... You're, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so please, please, please do. Um, and Matt, I hope that we see some articles from you that we can kind of peek into. Okay. Yeah. Um, and for everyone, again, um, on this theme of art and activism, um, make a crane. Let's yes. put it up. Make let's, a crane. Let's share some thoughts together. Um, and uh, we'll be up for everyone to see. So we'll give everyone a good month to fold cranes. So start folding, guys. Um, and we will see what happens from there because things keep moving forward, even if you're uncomfortable with it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, uh, Yuki, do, do you have a book? Oh, 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 thank you. Um, you mean the Japanese book? Somebody uh, said I would like to read Miyamoto Sensei's book in our in our chat here. Yeah. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I have an English book which came out in 2011. And just a week ago, I saw uh, my new book in, in Japanese uh, came out. So thank you for noticing it. <laughs> I, I also want to um, also want to point out uh, the person that commented. Uh, Flint is um, Flint is one of our first viewers to subscribe to Tokyo House Party, oh. um, which is something that is absolutely not required by any of our viewers. Um, we hope to to always be able to bring you this content, but subscribing or donating to Tokyo House Party um, adds funds to the Japanese Arts Foundation, so that we can continue to do more and more things like this. And so, um, please, please, uh, at the very least. Uh, share Tokyo House Party around and, and tell people about the types of conversations that we have so that we can um, continue having. So thank you, Flint, for that. And thank you for the wonderful comment there. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. And gosh, I can't I can't say thank you enough for everyone today and, and all of your time and your expertise and your insights and your thoughts and your feelings. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Sarah. Uh, you are such a source of inspiration and motivation. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's true. It's true. Uh, I I really hope that um, the part two version of this that we get to have. Uh, I absolutely there's there's so many more things that I I want to be able to get into, um, and and hopefully um, to be able to touch on you know like we had talked about earlier the the representations in cinema and media, um, and 
and again, in an attempt to kind of educate our viewers at home and myself, because I'm, I'm really, really engaged by this topic and um, because of coming from a background in, in, in these types of media. And so uh, I'm really thrilled to, to receive all this education from you both. And I want to um, I want to keep it going. Me too. Me too. So I guess we can count on us having another show about this and we will be reaching out to you both. Oh, is this Carrie um, Ross? I bet it is. We have another DePaul uh, Japanese history professor with us. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I feel so Thank terrible you. very far over. And we have one more amazing component left for our night that you can't leave. Um, Ty and Van are preparing something I don't even know what to I don't know what to, what it's going to be yet it's going to be amazing but they are merging city pop music and um origami folding of cities together and um they will be hosting on Van's channel which we will merge with our own Derek you you know much more about techie I don't know what that means exactly but that's what I understand and again the the cities that you fold the buildings that you fold the cranes that you fold please follow us on social media to find out how you can send those to us by of course or we of course will send you emails and keep bothering you for them because the more people who participate the more wonderful it will be so please yes yeah. yes uh yes viewers at home uh, don't go anywhere. What we'll do is to kind of take the screen to a short be right back. And then we will, uh, once Vans channel goes live, uh, we will host that here. And so not only will you be able to follow Vans channel directly if you so choose, but you can stay seated on this channel and, and watch uh, everything that Van and Ty will be uh, getting into. Um, thanks again, uh, Matt Yuki for, for joining us and uh, uh, give a, a wonderful wave to our, our viewers at home. Hmm. Thank you. It was great to be to have this conversation. I appreciated everyone's insight and thoughtfulness. I learned a lot. We learned a lot. Thank you. Yes. Cool. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Uh,